In Gotham Knights, the frame rate will sometimes drop to below 20 frames per second in the open world. This is very good performance for a 2022 AAA video game. It is a reasonable expectation that this game would cost £65. In Gotham Knights, you unlock fast travel by standing on a rooftop and waiting for a drone to dock so you can scan it. You can't scan the drone until it docks. This is creative. In Gotham Knights, you can't change the colour of transmogged outfits. You can only change the colour of an original. In Gotham Knights, the story makes you do open world quests to get Penguin's attention. In Gotham Knights, there is a boss fight with Harley Quinn where you fight In Gotham Knights, the talons can't be hurt unless you use one specific one attack that takes a couple of seconds to charge off. In Gotham Knights, Man Bat isn't a boss, he's a regular enemy. You have to fight three of them in the open world while you wait for the story. In Gotham Knights, you go to Arkham Asylum and the game crashes out of embarrassment, which is really smart when you think about it because it's the game giving you the opportunity to play something else. One, two, three. I don't like Gotham Knights. I don't like its story, I don't like its Gotham, I don't like its upgrade system, I don't like its bugs, I don't like how it feels to play online, I don't like its combat, I don't like its stealth, I don't like a single thing about its design philosophy, and most of all, I don't like what its existence says about the games industry. Somewhere deep in the bowels of Warner Brothers is a whiteboard with a great version of this game scribbled onto it. Batman is dead, a new kind of hero needs to take up the mantle, an heir to the cowl kind of story that lets a new generation meet some of the Bat family. The Court of Owls is getting their video game debut. Here is a game devoted to letting you play as Batgirl, Red Hood, Nightwing or Robin, coming from a studio that wrote Arkham Origins, arguably the best story in the Arkham series. This is a game all about removing yourself from the legacy of the Bat, stepping out of his shadow. That's the thematic focus of our four heroes, a thematic focus that gets completely undermined in the last 15 minutes of the game, but ironically, it's the metatextual focus of its developer WB Montreal. Their last game was Arkham Origins. They're a studio that spent the early 2010s looking like Rocksteady's sidekick. It's a game that keeps making you think it's about to get good, but never does. Maybe when I lock gliding, exploration won't suck so much. Maybe when I've leveled up enough, the combat won't feel like a grind. Maybe when the plot actually starts doing Court of Owls stuff, it'll start getting exciting. Maybe if I play with friends, I'll be able to find the fun. But that moment never comes, because there is nothing to sink your teeth into here. It's a brittle, hollow shell, made cynically, written farcically, engineered poorly, and designed not with fun in mind, but an always turning grindstone labelled player engagement. That's not speculation either. Whilst Gotham Knights isn't a highly monetized live service like Marvel's Avengers, Anthem, Destiny and The Division, in fact to date there's only one in-game purchase available, it was designed similarly to those games with player retention as the priority. That mandate likely came from Warner Brothers directly. The fact Rocksteady Suicide Squad is also a live service game says a lot, but they've also been pushing the idea in their job adverts as early as 2021, stating they're looking for interns to help with a variety of projects with a quote, heavy focus on live service. But even then, this is a design philosophy that has been spoken aloud by the game's creative director, Patrick Redding. At San Diego Comic-Con in 2022, he said, Quote, the Arkham games are classics, and they'll continue to attract new players more and more. But when we set out to build Gotham Knights, we said, we are building a long engagement experience. That's the idea we started with, and then we built the whole game around that. It's interesting that Patrick mentions the Arkham series there. I've recently covered all four mainline titles in critiques just like this one, so they're pretty fresh in my mind. Those games gave me interesting things to do, with a variety of scenarios and contexts, mechanics that were intrinsically satisfying to engage with, stories to care about, and unique moments that will forever live on in my memory. That's how those games kept me playing. That's how those games kept me coming back by making me enjoy myself. I know, crazy idea for a video game. As a bat game, Gotham Knights lives in Arkham Shadow. I challenge anyone to find a reputable review that didn't mention Arkham Knight, at least in passing. But Rocksteady's series isn't the only measuring stick we can compare the game to. Guardians of the Galaxy came out in 2021, a game about a team of heroes up against the odds. Gotham Knight's dialogue sounds like it was written in crayon when we put the two games side by side. Insomniac Spider-Man gives us awesome traversal, varied combat, and a world teeming with history and passion. Gotham Knight's world feels like it was coughed up after an all-nighter in Vegas. Marvel's Avengers, despite amounting to broken corporate backwash, at least gave us four-player co-op at launch. 
Gotham Knights didn't. And even today, it's only available in specific raid modes. Even if you forget Arkham altogether, even if you imagine that series never existed, Gotham Knights still sucks. A frame rate that peaks at 30 but hardly ever hits it, even on consoles. Bugs and crashes at WB Montreal claim to have been patched out, but most definitely haven't been. I could forgive those things if the game had a single unique bone in its body, but it doesn't. It's almost a shame, because pretty much everything Gotham Knights gets wrong, it steals from other AAA glop from the past five years. We've seen these systems a million times. I know I've seen that UI before. We've heard the quotes about player retention for half a decade. We've run through bloated open worlds more times than I can count. It's just unfortunately, Gotham Knights is the straw that broke the camel's back. In this case, the camel is me. In an effort to escape the shadow of the bat, it just reminds us of all the crap parts of every other game it steals from. I've been throwing shade at it since it came out. I was pissed off that I spent 70 bucks on it, and if you've watched any of my recent videos, you'll know that I still am. But it could have been free, and it wouldn't change my feelings. Gotham Knights takes characters that I love from stories I adore, forces them into a meat grinder, and plops out a game that stands for everything I despise about the AAA action space nowadays. So, I'm not holding back in this one. It's gonna get petty, it's gonna get nitpicky. Sometimes it's gonna sound a little whiny, and I'm even obnoxiously going to throw in a few ways I think it should have been designed for good measure. It's the four horsemen of the YouTube criticism apocalypse. I've had some lovely comments saying that you like it when I try to look at a game as a whole, trying to be balanced, acknowledging the good stuff, even if I don't like the game. Thank you for saying that, but you're not gonna find that here. I'm telling you straight away so you don't waste your time if that's the sort of vibe you're looking for. This video is more for me than it is for you. But hey, if you stick around, maybe we'll all find a little catharsis along the way. And while subjectivity is always implied with my videos, it's worth me saying that if you enjoyed this game, if you play it regularly, I'm not here to tell you you're wrong. Like what you like, nobody has to love or hate the things that I love or hate. But you, me, WB Montreal, and these characters deserved a lot better. Despite every effort, Gotham Knights remain stuck in the shadow of the bat. It's borderline irredeemable. Nothing about the game is engaging, interesting, unique, or even fucking functional. So let's look at a game that one guy on Metacritic described as an unoptimized mess promoting the woke agenda. We are not on the same team. This is a commentary and critique of Gotham Knights. Here are some things I like about Gotham Knights. Batman's suit. The starter outfits for the knights, not you, Robin. This funeral shot of the black umbrellas in the shape of a bat. The idea of its version of Harley Quinn. The Clayface encounters. The credits. Watching interviews with the voice actors. They seem nice. Here is the first thing I don't like about Gotham Knights. The opening. If you're watching this, I'm dead. 16 minutes and 2 seconds. That's how long it takes for us to take control of one of our heroes. A pre-recorded message flashes up on screen from Bruce Wayne saying goodbye to his family, passing his legacy on to Nightwing, Batgirl, Red Hood and Robin. Ra's al Ghul has tracked him to the Batcave and the two titans have a battle to the death in an explosive, high-octane, unskippable short film. It's gorgeously animated with crunchy choreography. Very particular attention was spent, making this as exciting and explosive as possible. Possible, with numerous outsiders being brought in to work on it. Bear McCarthy of God of War and Game of Thrones fame even orchestrated the score that accompanied the sequence. This is nothing new, and not even necessarily a criticism. Numerous development teams have relied on outside animators and some coordinators for big, sexy cinematics like these in the past. Cubic Motion, for example, is an organization that's been used by Insomniac, Santa Monica Studios, and a bunch of EA devs. The problem isn't that the battle between Batman and Ra's al Ghul isn't cool, it is, it's that it's wholly unnecessary. All of the explosions and detailed motion capture in the world can't replace the most important thing to get right in the opening of an action game. Gameplay. There are two fade out moments that make you think you're about to transition to playing the damn thing, but oh no, 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 the fight is still going, it's just been broken up into numerous cutscenes with odd transitions. Keep your eyes on these by the way, they'll return at least another three dozen times before the credits roll. We should have played as Batman in this opening, we should have gotten to experience his final moments, we should have been able to inject some of our resolve and our discipline and our skills as a tutorial set piece to get our blood pumping. The opportunities are endless in how the fight was choreographed and there's even a 
clear trajectory of combat mechanics to follow. Light attacks, heavy attacks, ranged attacks and heavy ranged attacks could have been incorporated into the battle on top of the Batwing, the sparring match around the T-Rex, and there are beats where Batman needs to grapple to a vantage point which would have been a great opportunity to show us how grappling works. But even if all of this had to stay as a cinematic, why wasn't the armory a gameplay sequence? Raish powers up, drawing on the Dionysium in his system to find renewed strength. He and Batman crash into the training facility of the Batcave that has swords, spears, all sorts of weapons and tools that are reminiscent of the weapons and tools that the knights will later use. Batman could have grabbed a spear so we get to experience Robin's fighting style with the bow staff. A couple of Eskrima sticks would have let us change into Nightwing's style of play. Red Hood's guns wouldn't be in keeping with the Bat's character, but there are plenty of substitutes for those in the form of dark guns and the like. Batgirl is a heavy-hitting brawler with batarangs, so her incorporation speaks for itself. Raish's power-up could have taught us about the importance of elemental strikes. Maybe one of the weapons Batman grabs does ice damage, and we could see how different kinds of powered-up enemies are weak to different types of elements. What this would do, ultimately, is give us an idea of how powered up the knights could be once they've unlocked all of their abilities. Once you've fully leveled one up, there are eight upgrades to pull from during fights. It takes so much grinding to get to that point, that very few players are ever going to have a souped up Batgirl or Nightwing, but if the tutorial showed us what any of these abilities could be like, maybe that would incentivize that grind. The cutscene is lowercase cool, but it's the mother of missed opportunities, a through line that'll rear its ugly head again and again as we carry on through the game. Many of you knew Bruce from Gotham's celebrity pages, a handsome, charming billionaire. <laughs> and he was that. But he was more than a headline. He was my nephew. The Knights find Batman's body in the rubble of Wayne Manor to act as confirmation that he's definitely totally really dead, for real, I promise he's dead, just trust me. Seeing no way out and hoping to take Ra's al Ghul with him, Bruce opted to blow the whole thing up, killing himself and taking his old foe out in the process. This is his only move. Within a week, Gotham changes. It's not just Batman who's gone, it's Bruce Wayne, the Prince of Gotham. Half of the city turns out for his funeral, led by Colonel Jacob Kane, husband of Commissioner Catherine Kane and Bruce's uncle. In the comics, Jacob is also the father of Batwoman, annoyingly called Catherine with a K. It's a whole thing, her mother is actually called Gabby, not Catherine with a C. He's been shoehorned into a plot he has no business being in, presumably because WB Montreal were thinking of making his daughter, Catherine with a K, Batwoman, suddenly appear in a live service mission as a new playable hero that would at first be at odds with the knights, maybe? Who knows, it doesn't matter, what matters is the status quo this funeral sets up. Jacob, not Alfred, not Dick. Jacob is speaking at Bruce's funeral. Commissioner Cat stands alongside him. Jim Gordon is dead, so she's reshaped the GCPD since taking office. The cops of Gotham now hate vigilantes. Suspicious. Oh wait, sorry, we don't learn any of that here. We learn it in the closing seconds of our 16 minute cutscene where the knights stand in a circle and spout exposition at each other. Catherine wouldn't be there if she suspected. I can't see the anti-vigilante police commissioner presiding at Batman's funeral. Who needs economic storytelling? This heavy, heavy emphasis on exposition rather than characterization is something that carries into a lot of Gotham Knight's main plot. This is primarily because the structure of the game is so paper thin, forcing open world grinding to pad out the game time, so far too many of our story beats are delivered like this. The four knights stand in a room, Alfred creeps about in the background, a hologram of a building or a person pops up, and they all recap the story so far in case we're somehow lost. In fact, just like when I covered Arkham Knight, I wanted to quantify this, so here's some numbers to better represent my point. Including the optional knighthood conversations and the villain-led side quests like Harley Quinn or Mr. Freeze, there are 81 cutscenes in the game. Out of those 81, 40 of them take place in our base of operations, the Belfry. Out of that 40, 22 of them are purely based around exposition, the holograms, recapping the case, etc. Okay, you might think, that doesn't seem so bad, that still leaves 41 cutscenes that are out in the world, in the action, meeting shadowy figures on rooftops or confronting the bad guys. That's kinda true, because that number mainly revolves around scenes like this, where it's 10 seconds long, and a new enemy type like the Gladiator Talon is introduced, and a knight says something quippy like, oh boy. There is character writing here, but it's scurried away in optional knighthood conversations, 86% of which are in the Belfry, and four of which are identical to one another. Like the new look? 
This place is quite remarkable. It's certainly brighter than the Bat Cave. So? What do you think? This place is quite remarkable. It's certainly brighter than the Bat Cave. <laughs> Belfry's really coming together. This place is quite remarkable. It's, it's certainly, certainly brighter than the Bat Cave. And no matter which character you're playing as or who's taking center stage, all of them are written with the gravitas of cardboard. Some of the knights, like Dick Grayson, have 62 years of characterization to draw on, but they're all reduced to having one gimmick, one gimmick only, and any time they're not written to focus purely on that gimmick, they lack any sort of unique voice. Instead, their voices are dry, tired. In the comics, Nightwing is a hero constantly in a state of identity flux. He's focused on the future, not on the past, trying to find his place in the superhero community. From Robin to Nightwing to Agent 37, even taking the mantle of the Bat after Bruce Wayne died in Batman R.I.P. He even went undercover with a new moniker, Red X, to get closer to Deathstroke in the Teen Titans TV show. He moves forward, always. It's a defining character trait that makes him so interesting because he was raised by a man stuck firmly in the past. In Gotham Knights, he's excited about a cat roaming the Belfry. Okay, that's not all he's been given. He's also been bizarrely assigned the role of leader by his mechanics. Many of his abilities are built for co-op. But you wouldn't know that from literally any of the scenes he's featured in, because the story's take is that he's a gibbering idiot who barely ever understands what's going on. Perhaps. Help. Batgirl also has an extensive and detailed history, a photographic memory, a complicated romantic relationship with Dick, a social activist, an expert hacker and strategist, severe mental and physical disabilities that she battles on a daily basis. Where Dick Grayson is determined to shed the shackles of being Batman's sidekick, Barbara Gordon was always her own hero. She's the only member of the group who wasn't raised by Bruce, who didn't live in Wayne Manor, which means that if Batman died, she might feel like an outsider in a family who's more Morning. Gotham Knight's version hints to… some of this? Kind of? She has an ability that lets her summon a drone. She can scan cameras and deactivate them from a distance, something that is completely useless considering all of our heroes, even bloody Red Hood, can just shoot them to deactivate them. She can push a couple of buttons on a tablet. She knows how to plug a USB stick into a computer, which is more than can be said for whatever drooling idiot is wearing Dick Grayson's face in this game. Did I mention I can't wait to meet this cat? But none of this is ever capitalized on in a meaningful way that showcases her intelligence, because Alfred takes over all of the that computer stuff, and Tim Drake keeps invading her scenes to make them all about him. So, we're in the Belfry, right? Which which was Oracle space. And these boys are invading into the elf, uh, Belfry at the, at the top of the game, right? The Belfry was her home after she was disabled and changed to Oracle, her own private sanctum that she retreated to after Joker's attack. How does she feel about sharing it? And also, why isn't there a lift to the second floor, seeing as this was her home and she was in a wheelchair when her and Batman set it up? Environmental storytelling, baby. Yeah love to see it. You're crowding me. Miss Gordon. The hollow imaging system is back online as of this morning. Perfect timing, Alfred. This rendition of Tim Drake might be one of the most irritating characters I've had the displeasure of playing as in the past decade. Each of the knights had their own writer assigned to them, who requested that hero, and I want to meet the person who wrote Tim because they must hate him if this is the sort of characterization they're focusing on. The worst part is Gotham Knights almost gets him right, but presents everything that makes him fun and lovable as annoying, stilted, and detrimental. He's the world's second greatest detective, a Batman fanboy with a tight relationship with Nightwing, two brothers against the world. He chose this life just like Barbara did. He ought to gravitate towards Towards these two knights because they have common ground and empathy to tap into. There should be conflict between him and Red Hood because he was the Robin who replaced Jason after he died. That conflict is never ending in the source material, down to the point where Jason stages his death in the Battle for the Cowl storyline. His keen mind sort of exists, but it's barely on the surface level. The most detective work he does in the plot is pulling a picture of Penguin out of a book. So smart, very brains, good work Tim. His adoration of Batman means he feels displaced now that Bruce is dead, but it's given to us through tantrums and whining. A bond between him and Barbara is hinted to because the two of them keep geeking out, but none of their geekery is impressive or even intelligent because the plot and conspiracy is so contrived. On the page, he's a child that's wise beyond his years. In the game, he's a child who should have stayed at home. But it's not fair! What Talia did! 
How are you not angry about that? And then there's Jason. Oh, Jason. Jason's relationship with Batman is complicated. Even to this day, he harbours resentment against Bruce for failing him all of those years ago and not exacting revenge on the Joker for his murder. In stories like the previously referenced Battle for the Cowl, he's the antagonist. Batman's death makes him snap. He was the one thing anchoring him into some moral grounding, but without Bruce around, he wears the cape and goes on a killing spree. Bruce's death makes him nihilistic. In his new 52 run, Red Hood and the Outlaws, he has a leadership role thrust upon him, something he gradually grows into despite a clunky as hell plot. Gotham Knight's Jason Todd has one character trait. Well, I could tell you a story. It's about being dead. Did it hurt, Jason? <laughs> when I fell from heaven? <laughs> when you came back to life? Bruce blamed himself for your death. The Lazarus pit? Going in a Lazarus pit once is hell. Hasn't Harley Quinn been out of Gotham ever since, you know, her ex? Killed me? I used to be dead. All right, I get it. These character attributes are flashes of brilliance in the optional knighthood vignettes. Barbara mourns not just Bruce, but her father as well. She has a crisis of faith in her own abilities because she can't remember what he looks like despite having a photographic memory. There's a great scene where she recreates some of Jim's old crime scenes that is totally ruined when Tim Drake just wanders in and manhandles the figure of her dad because he's the absolute worst. Or later, when she's putting the finishing touches on the crime scene and bonds with Jason over her anger at herself. But it's hard not to focus on that if you notice the fact her hair is suddenly brown, not red. Or when Dick and Jason sit quietly on a rooftop together and share in each other's company. This scene doesn't do anything special, but it stands out because it is literally the only scene in the entire game where two knights are in Gotham together. Or the chess through line between Tim and Alfred, which starts as a touching setup where Alfred is playing an unfinished game between him and Bruce that leaves itself wide open to Tim eventually sitting down and finishing the game with him, solidifying that he is Bruce's replacement of the world's greatest detective. But that doesn't happen. Instead, they just keep playing different games of chess many times. We can trace Dick and Babs becoming closer again through incidental dialogue about puns. Towards the end of the game, while we're walking around the Belfry, Barbara will out-pun Dick. It's just a shame that any context for this growth is relegated to emails. I'm not kidding when I say an easy 80% of the knight's character work and world building is done in the main menu. Throughout the story, they'll send each other emails, or receive emails, or get bloody spam emails that we need to comb through for any hint of depth. Dick is the new head of Wayne Enterprise, Prizes. You wouldn't know it without the emails. He and Jason joke a lot about who the best Robin was and it bothers Tim. You wouldn't know that without the emails. There's someone running around Bloodhaven calling themselves Nightwing. That sounds like an interesting side story, but it's not developed beyond one email. Jason especially is a victim of this. He's seeing a therapist, he's reading self-help books, he pitches a program to Dick for Wayne Enterprises to fund information sessions and reach out work for underprivileged kids, a reference to his poverty stricken upbringing. That sounds like some bang up characterization that should be in the actual game, but instead we get scenes where Dick jokes about Jason's traumatic death. Great empathy coming from our cast of heroes. When I talked about Guardians of the Galaxy, I pointed out that one of the most impressive things about that game's writing is its sense of history. It's not just the easter eggs or environmental storytelling that contributes to this, it's the conversations between our team. Drax and Rocket argue about dancing, and through that argument we learn more about Katara culture and his belief system. We pick up details and stories about old heists and adventures the team have been on. The galactic war bubbles over every story beat, informing the fact nowhere is now full of refugees and fleshing out why the Universal Church of Truth is able to convert half of the galaxy so easily. Gotham Knights has very little sense of history. In fact, in some cases it seems to go out of its way to purposefully miss out key details that any player trying to get invested in its world will be looking for. Jim Gordon is dead. We never learn how he died. Hell, we're not even given a timeline for how recent his death is. Inexplicably, Lucius Fox has left Wayne Tech to form Fox Tekka. This is something pulled from the Batman Beyond universe and involves a hostile takeover by the villain Blight. But in Gotham Knights universe, we have no sense of why Lucius would have left Wayne Enterprises during his partnership with Bruce. Did he just want to set his own path? Who knows? Dick and Barbara dated, quite seriously it seems, but have since broken up. 
Why did they break up? What was their relationship like? This seems like a pretty key part of their respective histories and would probably inform how they interact with each other, but it's never shown, told, or winked at. There are two major breakouts of Blackgate Prison. Arkham Asylum is shut down, so where have all of Gotham's criminals gone? There's no sense that they're active in this version of Gotham, busy with their own plans and stories. They're just absent. I don't need a full compendium for each of Batman's rogues, but according to Gotham Knights, this is a city of demons that has precisely three classic villains living in it. But the game's biggest problem is in how it treats Joker. To be clear, I don't need or want to see Joker in Gotham Knights. I don't need him to be a baddie that we tackle, but a bunch of characters talk around him. Harley, Alfred, Jason, Bruce, they all confirm in one way or another that he exists in this world, yet not one of them mentions him by name. This wouldn't be too important if we were dealing with DC heroes that barely ever interacted with him, but Barbara, Jason, and Harley are well-known characters whose histories are defined by him. Bruce literally documents the moments when Barbara was paralyzed and Jason was killed. With Barbara, he mentions that madman. With Jason, he doesn't even hint to the circumstances surrounding his death. Harley sends out emails to the team that references her abusive relationship with him. No name. Later, when we work through the remnants of the Batcave, we find a humongous Joker card. This is the only object in this cave that doesn't get a wall of text that tells us the backstory behind it. Towards the end of the game, there's a nice, optional scene between Jason and Barbara where they connect over their shared trauma. But you know what would have made this scene more effective? If either of our cardboard heroes actually talked about the person that hurt them irreparably. Say his name, you clowns! We never learn the circumstances surrounding Jason's death, despite the fact it is his defining character trait in the game. He reminds us at every given opportunity that he died and was brought back by the Lazarus Pit, but if I hadn't read Death in the Family, which bear in mind a lot of younger players probably won't have because it's a 34 year old comic, I wouldn't be able to tell you a single thing about how or why Jason died from this game. Well, at least there's time for a Mothman joke, because this is 2015. But okay, so our team of heroes aren't explicitly written heroically. Fine. Arkham's Batman was a stoic, brooding figure who didn't regularly talk about truth and justice, but his actions and the player's actions spoke much louder than words, so we didn't need it. Every Arkham game, including the one developed by WB Montreal, opened with gameplay that involves saving people. What does Gotham Knights do? Bad news. Langstrom is dead. Any idea where I can find his office? Langstrom's dead. Nightwing goes to Gotham University to find the scientist Kirk Langstrom. Batman was investigating him before he died. His name is locked away in a case file that would apparently shake Gotham to its core. Curious. We find a bunch of sea creatures locked in ominous tanks filled with green liquid. Curiouser. A flash drive sits on one of his desks. Maybe that has the answer. But even more curious, sir, is that Langstrom is already dead. Someone got here first and some bad guys are running rampant. Which means we do save people, sort of. It's not quite a pillar that this sequence is built around, like say, saving the guard from Zaz in Arkham Asylum, or saving Catwoman in Arkham City. Nightwing slouches over to a couple of people tied up behind this counter, and as he tries to untie them, he's interrupted by a brute. So the focus isn't on the heroism, it's on the game's sluggish combat mechanics. It's not the core objective, it's not the goal, it's just a thing that happens in a cutscene while our real objective is beat up some goons. I didn't even know someone else was in the university. We're given the impression that it was empty and abandoned tonight until this very brief cutscene. Which I know is a nitpick, but Nightwing, Batgirl, and Robin specifically are supposed to be that lighter side to the Batman fantasy. Their focus should return to their saving of Gotham's people, rather than an asylum. Oh well, alright, it, it doesn't matter. Look, we're not playing as superheroes. We're playing as shadows. This isn't Nightwing. This is Nightwing's cardboard cousin, Shitewing. And even though the game makes a bad first impression, we haven't even started to talk about where it really fails. Crap. That must have been the secondary breaker. The primary went out months ago. I thought the backup would hold. I got it. No need. I've put in a small fix that should hold for a while. The Belfry is our base of operations, once the home of Barbara Gordon when she was Oracle. It's now a refuge, offering the team a chance to regroup and plan their next steps. It's a shell, covered in dark shabby sheets, blocking out light, leaving dust hanging loosely in the air. 
The power's out, and this all seems like a solid setup for some base building mechanics. There are already so many random currencies and materials and bloat to collect in the open world, which we will get to, that it lends itself perfectly to upgrading and customising our safe space. Midnight Suns adopted a system just like this, and it's a cosy time sink, but that's an idea that's raised and dropped almost immediately. Alfred arrives, tells us he's got a backup generator, and in the space of 30 minutes he'll have the Belfry fully operational. Hooray! But first, he needs us to go out and beat up some muggers. It's given the facade of collecting supplies, but I'm pretty sure the paint job the Belfry needs isn't blood coloured. This is going to happen a lot. The narrative will crunch to a halt while we do busy work, and so that you don't just take my word for it, let's start a counter. Great. So, with our knights bouncing out into Gotham City, let's talk traversal. I say bouncing because that's exactly how we get around, unless you want to while away the hours on a bat cycle with the top speed below the speed limit. I have to assume the reason for this is to give the game time to load, but even when you're crawling or hell, just walking, the city is coated in poppin', stutters and jank. Yes, even when playing offline. Yes, even after the myriad of patches. Call the Justice League lads, this guy can sit on air. Gotham hasn't been designed for the bat cycle in a way that makes it feel integral to getting about. You might have dark memories of Arkham Knight's tank battles, but that version of Gotham was built to be played in, with numerous ramps, activities and architecture that sometimes necessitated the Batmobile and oftentimes encouraged it. The Gotham of Gotham Knights feels like it's made of plastic. Less a toy box and more a model that your dad painted and you're not allowed to touch. For example, there's a train that tours the islands, stopping at various stations along the way. We can, with a lot of difficulty, land on top of the bloody thing. It would be really cool if we could ride it to its next stop. It would be another traversal option that shows the knights can control Gotham and turn it into a tool, the same way Batman did. Shame then that we just glitch off the damn thing once it starts moving. The streets are barren, aside from the same five vehicles copy-pasted to try and give the illusion of motion. Sometimes you'll bump into one of ten NPC models who say something vague like, hey, it's that vigilante, but none of this is an incentivizer for riding around on the bike. The various paint jobs we can unlock are neat enough, but that customization feels limiting in its own right. You can't change out parts or color wheels independently of the seat. You just pick a skin and slap it on, and considering the game's overall emphasis on crafting and customization, this feels like a limited part of the design rather than something purposeful. We'll um come back to this later. The Adobe Premiere speed lines that fade in on the corners of the screen try to create the illusion of speed, but once you realise how slow and stiff the bike is, they just come off as cheap. The cycle is missing a turbo boost to make us feel like we have solid control over our speed and momentum. Because the acceleration is so quick, which is a good thing, but the top speed is so low, which is a tedious thing, all engagement with the bike plummets after three seconds of holding the R2 button, especially because there are no obstacles on the road aside from a couple of taxis. The worst part is the initial drive to the Belfry makes it seem like Gotham will be a lot busier than it is, with regular police roadblocks blocks to crash through and a route that tutorialises thinking creatively about how we get around. But the thought process taught to us here never returns while getting around on the bike. That's mainly because WB Montreal clearly didn't listen to the criticisms levied against Arkham Origins world design. The huge length of the Pioneer Bridge separated that game between gliding around two parts of a city and yawning as we pushed up on the analogue sticks. Gotham Knights is here to tell you to shut your yap. You're not dealing with one bridge now, you're dealing with seven. Open wide and guzzle them whole because they take an age to cross and there's nothing interesting to see except for the bloody poppin'. Which means the over-reliance on bridges doesn't just slow down exploration, but they actively make the game's technical issues more obvious. My beloved has trained you well. Didn't he tell you to stay out of Gotham? Dead men's wishes don't concern me. Besides, I'm here to clean up my father's mess. After beating up some random goons in Gotham, Alfred tells us that he can't decrypt Kirk Langstrom's drive. It's locked behind his bio signature, so we need to muster over to the GCPD morgue to find his body. This is a level that's all about the stealth, because Gotham's cops have humongous hit bars and don't afford us XP if we beat them up. Commissioner Catherine Kane's grip on the GCPD has warped all of the good work Jim Gordon did. We see that corruption has returned to the force, with secret, undocumented interrogations happening behind closed doors. It seems like all Gotham needed to fall back into the abyss was one dead commissioner and one dead Batman. That would have been an interesting angle for Gotham Knights to take. What exactly is Batman's legacy in the world? What impact did he make on the city? How is the GCPD responding to his mysterious absence? Yeah, that would have been interesting.
Anyway, it's here that Nightwing sees a familiar face, Talia Al Ghul, plopped into a Batman story for the hundredth time in the past decade. I've made my thoughts on her pretty clear in my Arkham City video, so won't repeat the points here, but I'll at least give Gotham Knights props for trying something a little bit different with her. She incinerates her father's body, gone for good, and when we catch up with her, she claims she did it to free the League of Assassins from his Dionysium-induced madness. It'll make her an enemy of the League, but she thinks it was worth it, and it's with a graceful leap to finish the scene that we see the next problem with getting around in the game. Overall, the movement in Gotham Knights is stiffer than me watching the Spider-Man 2 trailer. It looks so good, you guys. Every. Single action has an input delay. I can only imagine this is, once again, on purpose to compensate for online play. But even offline there's a delay before jumping, there's a delay when trying to turn on a gargoyle, there's a delay before deploying Batgirl's cape, and worst of all, there's a delay between leaving a grapple and leaping into the air. The advantage of making it with four different characters is that we bring to the table four very different viewpoints, four different narrative styles, four different gameplay styles, which means there's at least one character for every player out there to really fall in love with and enjoy the game with. In any other game, these delays would be frustrating, but it is especially so here, because two of our heroes are specifically known for their agility. Neither Robin or Nightwing feel as fast and fluid as they're supposed to. Particularly Dick, who is a bloody acrobat, should feel much more responsive if WB Montreal were truly trying to engineer four unique heroes who feel different to control. But even when you're not on Gotham's rooftops or stuttering about on the Bat Cycle, the general movement is a disaster. It's like we're magnetised to parts of the world, which is ironic seeing as they can't cling to the top of a train. Sticking issues are abound, where you'll get stuck on ledges and won't be able to turn, or stuck on random assets, or hell, sometimes you'll just get stuck on air. It's like the collision detection has morphed with some other system, so objects are trying to swallow up your night. Even just standing still, we can't do a tight turn. The axis of your character seems to snap in one of eight directions rather than a simple 360 degree turn, but even even that is so inconsistent that you can't get fully used to how you move. It's almost like WB Montreal were so determined not to use the already established and incredibly successful gliding mechanics from the Arkham series out of fear that people would make comparisons. But by trying to run away from Arkham, it just makes for a lesser game. It either should have embraced a similar methodology, or do something completely different. This hollow middle ground achieves nothing. What I would have liked is a focus on a smaller scale, concentrating on density rather than size. Gotham could have been turned into a playground, with opportunities for wall running, wall jumping, and mid-air dashes on top of the grapple as standard parts of each knight's moveset. Because let me tell you, the knighthood abilities barely make a dent. God, that jump looks fucking garbage. <laughs> There's no way for me to go up with it. Here is a list of the things you need to do to unlock gliding for Batgirl. Number one, complete the time strike tutorial in the training room. If you've already done this for Jason, Dick, or Tim, you'll learn nothing new. Number two, defeat three mini bosses. Examples include gladiator talons, godmothers, or bulldozers. Number three, stop ten random crimes in the open world and hoover up the clues to unlock premeditated crimes the next time you go out into Gotham. And number four, complete 10 premeditated crimes. This is a cacophony of hoops to jump through to unlock something that should have been in the game from the very beginning. All in, you'll be looking at two hours of dedicated play to tick off each of these boxes. Of course, mini boss enemies will appear in the main story missions, but the arduous process of unlocking premeditated crimes and then solving them makes that single convenience a minor one. You have to rinse and repeat each of these steps for each night. So that's eight hours of play to unlock a new movement option. This sort of grind will return again when we look at combat. Yeah, I can double check Talia's kunai for trace materials that we can track. We should also hit the streets, find out if anyone had any beef with Langstrom. Sweet. Time to bust some skulls. With Langstrom's biodecryption secured, the team learned that he was experimenting on criminals, pumping strange chemicals into their bodies for unknown reasons. Talia hinted that she knew more about this, so Tim uses his top-notch detective brain to theorise that if we talk to her, we might learn more. Tracking Talia isn't simple though. To find her, we need to interrogate some random thugs in Gotham. That means for a second time in the space of an hour, we need to go back into the open world and stop some crimes. And to add insult to injury, we quite literally learn nothing from doing this. The freaks we interrogate don't say anything tangible when we interrogate them, despite this being a main story quest. 
So, while we're doing absolutely nothing of substance, let's look at the knighthood abilities. Seeing as each one is attached to a 2 hour time sink, let's be transparent and see if they're worth it. Batgirl gets a glide, unfurling her cape to swoop down over rooftops. There's no grapple boost that lets us control her momentum or speed, but she can do a nosedive with a tight vertical angle that lets us come out and gain a little bit of height. The key term there is a little bit. There is no propulsion in that glide. From a skyscraper and by using the nosedive, Batgirl can just barely make it across the huge bays of water that separates each island. Nightwing's ability is a flying trapeze, which is the colourful name given to his Fortnite glider. It's the slowest ability out of the four, but it's also hilariously overpowered compared to the others, because it can climb through the sky by just pulling back on the analogue stick. Towards the end of the game, we need to scale a tower while shielding ourselves from drone attacks, but this whole section can be completely skipped by just very, very, very slowly gliding to the roof. Red Hood has a mystical leap. For some reason, his dip in the Lazarus Pit all of those years ago has engendered him with some actual superpowers that let him hop on air. There is no way to use the leap to gain height. No matter what, Red Hood will descend closer and closer to the ground while he uses it. What this means is you're expected to swap between the stiff grapple, delayed jump, and the mystical leap, which would lend itself to some dynamic movement, but all of the problems I previously outlined make it kinda worthless. And then there's Robin. <sighs> Jesus Christ. I want to speak to whoever pitched and designed Robin's knighthood ability. I want to go to a cafe somewhere, have 10 cups of coffee, ask them what they were trying to do, why they thought this was in any way fun, what technical limitations were in place to force this system, and why, at the end of all of it, they didn't give Tim the iconic wings from his red Robin days. After this conversation, I would dine and dash and leave them to pay the bill. It's the Justice League satellite, letting him teleport over short distances. That's the canon explanation, but in-game, it's got the speed and pizzazz of a drunken slug. It's far too slow, there's no player engagement aside from holding R2 and choosing his height. This is so dull that it actively disincentivizes using Robin. None of the hero abilities are that cool, but this takes the cake, and if you're gonna give Robin a teleport ability, why isn't it a part of his general movement? It feels like this was bolted on last minute because the team panicked that the cape he traditionally uses would be too similar to Batgirl and oh, every hero has to have a gimmick. No matter what the ability, all of the knights have the same lack of fluidity and responsiveness when moving into these powers and out of them. A full half second will pass between activating the ability and actually witnessing it activate. That combined with the fact our knights get stuck to surfaces means an action like, say, grappling Red Hood up a building, jumping over the roof of the building, and straight into a mystical leap simply won't happen. Instead, you'll grapple, jump, and then get glued to the roof so you need to do an awkward stiff little run before leaping off and transitioning into that leap. Whether it's by bike, foot, grapple, or air, traversal in Gotham Knights feels at best limited and at worst frustrating. You might think that running around the open world with a friend might dilute how wrong all of this feels, because you'll be lost in the spectacle of seeing your buddy fly through the air. But as we're about to find out, that is not remotely the case. This is Neil. Say hi, Neil. Hello. Neil is one of my co-hosts on my podcast, Lore Dump, the show where we take someone who hasn't played a game and walk them through the full story. Don't judge me, it's a new channel, it's a lot of fun, I'm gonna plug it here. Neil bought Gotham Knights just so we could play some of the game together. Neil has given up on Gotham Knights. Co-op. Well, that's not that, is it? That's it. I'm acutely aware that a lot of my problems with the game can be explained by its online co-op focus and live service buggery. Of course there's pop-in. Of course there are delayed inputs. Of course our primary means of interacting with the world is punching stuff. Of course there's a garbage loot system. Of course Gotham feels like a plastic model. How could you possibly design a two-player online co-op game any other way? I'm being facetious, but the counter to a lot of the criticisms levied at the game often fall into this camp. The game is a great time with friends. That's what I've heard, so let's take the next section to talk about that, and how it handles four playable characters. Hiya, Betsy. Been a while. It it's weird, cause I heard a rumor that you were dead. Oh boy. From deep inside Blackgate Prison, Harley Quinn sends a video to Batman, but the knights intercept. Dick tries to play the video, but doesn't know how to work an iPad, so asks Barbara to do it for him. It turns out, Harley's been doing some criminal profiling for Bats, helping him out, and she thinks she's got something that might be of use. 
The problem is Blackgate's in the midst of a full prison riot, so to reach her, Neil and I are going to need to kick some bad guys and punch some ass. When it comes to assessing Gotham Knights as a co-op game, there's one big fat banner that needs to hang over every word I'm about to say. The way this online experience has been designed is to blame for a lot of the game's bullshit. Don't just take my word for it, here's the executive producer Fleur Marty sneaking in a message to the game's Discord six days before release. Quote, I know many of you are wondering about the availability of a performance mode for Gotham Knights on consoles. Due to the type of features we have in our game, like providing a fully untethered co-op experience in our highly detailed open world, it's not as straightforward as lowering the resolution and getting a higher FPS. Here's the thing. Gotham Knights is better when playing with a friend, the same way watching Batman and Robin is better with a friend. Alone it's a miserable experience, but together you can at least wallow in the crappiness and have a giggle. But is that giggle worth it? Is a cap at 30 FPS that the game often falls short of worth it? Are input delays that make combat feel sticky and unresponsive worth it? Is a Gotham City that feels dull and lifeless worth it? Is level design that funnels you into one playstyle despite the different characters on offer worth it? Is pacing that's bogged down by level transitions like squeezing through doorways worth it? Because this is not some slick, fun co-op experience that increases in quality if you're joined by a buddy. In fact, very little is functionally added to the game when you're joined by a friend. So I'm just not here. Monty? Yeah. Where's... Where's Nightwing gone? <laughs> yeah. Has he gone off to do something else? None of the cutscenes acknowledge that two of the knights are involved. We just pop out of story beats when they happen because not a single mission is curated to make it feel like more than one knight undertakes an objective at any time. Neil and I started headcanoning that Nightwing was off for a piss every time some story stuff happened, as uninterested in this dirge of a plot as we were. Out in the world, you can't organise races against your partner, which would be a cool as hell distraction from the over-reliance on combat. The courses are right here in the form of time trials, why can't we activate them to challenge our friends? In combat, there's no sense of teamwork outside of a single button prompt. Enemies scale down to the weakest player's level. If I jump into Neil's game with my level 32 Nightwing, I still feel like a level 5 Nightwing fighting enemies who swallow up my ammunition. There's too much visual noise and camera wrestling at the best of times, but when you're thrown into the chaos of playing alongside someone else, all of that is doubled. It is a less pleasing game to play when you're doing co-op. I mean, Christ, can anyone actually tell me what's happening here? There is only one way that your knights can interact with each other in co-op. Dual takedowns. You weaken an enemy past half health, grab them, and then patiently wait while your partner comes to join in for a spectacular one-two punch. The animations are sexy as hell when they work, but because of the stiffness and the spamminess of the enemies, you'll be lucky if you're able to find an opening. You can't activate the takedown in a radius, instead you need to position yourself in one narrow opening, and that opening isn't ever communicated to the player. Do I need to stand to the side? The front? Who knows? And as I'm trying to fight the stickiness, I'll likely be thrashed by a Molotov cocktail or a gunman. And then, there's the stability issues. Well, you, no. <laughs> We're getting stuck on each other, we're like magnetically sticking to each other. Game chat would bug out completely, meaning in the end Neil and I had to call each other on our phones so we could communicate like a couple of pink ladies in Greece. Out in the open world, the frame rate might as well be static by how much and how consistently it dips. From Neil's perspective it looked like I was levitating, from my perspective he looked like a dick prancing around the open world with his mystical leap. For all of the praise rightfully given to the game for its untethered drop-in drop-out co-op, none of this is worth a damn when the game has an aneurysm when it's trying to maintain more than one player. Oh, but Monty, that never happened to me. Well, bloody... Good for you. But it did happen to me, on two separate internet connections at two separate locations. And when Marvel's Avengers of all things outdoes your servers, you know something's gone wrong. Many of the side quests aren't optimized for two players. Take, for example, the security missions where you need to break into a fenced area and plant some fake footage. Because I was Batgirl, I would hack the cameras and could be ignored by the lasers. Because Neil was Red Hood and there was no Red Hood specific obstacles, he could sit there and watch me play the game. Which sounds like a better time to be honest. So if the game isn't functionally different in co-op, in fact, in the case of frame rate, it's bloody worse, how does teaming up with our fellow knights feel offline? It doesn't let it do it offline. What do you mean it doesn't let you team up offline? I'm not talking about couch co-op. Again, the screen is so busy I legitimately think that would be impossible to comprehend in split screen. I'm talking about undertaking missions with AI-controlled knights. Again, the whole thematic focus of the game is how important it is for the Bat family to come together, lean on each other, rely on one another as they navigate a world without 
Batman, but the mission structure doesn't let you get that sense at any point, online or off. I mean, the design document writes itself. Can you imagine a heist mission where Batgirl and Robin break into, say, Wayne Tech to retrieve something, and we need to hop between them to deactivate security panels or stealthily take out guards? It wouldn't need to be every mission, and you wouldn't even need to pour this amount of effort into the side stuff, but during main story beats, how cool would that be? There isn't a sniff that this sort of design philosophy was on the table and scrapped because it was too complex. It doesn't sound like it was in the ballpark of what WB Montreal wanted to do. Instead, they wanted to make a game that's all about ringing out as much lowercase e engagement as possible in the form of grinding and gear and loot. So okay, I get it. Dynamic hopping between nights during story missions is too much to ask of a game that can't even keep me from falling through the map or Jason Todd's hoodie from poking out an eyeball at launch. But there's a severe lack of cohesion between what we're doing in the story versus the game's insistence on pretending we're playing co-op. For a start, if we get downed while playing single player, we have to sit through a respawn timer like we're waiting to be resurrected by another player. There's nobody else here. There's an insinuation that other heroes are out on the same missions as us, which is just insulting. That's not suspension of disbelief, it's just confusing because sometimes the game is very clear that just one knight went to a location, like later with Arkham Asylum, and other times it pretends all of the heroes went out on a mission together, but if they were, I didn't see them, and it doesn't make sense that they're all on comms back at the Belfry if they were. The worst offender is with the Court of Owls Labyrinth, which I have a whole rant about later on, but even during the busy work this leaks in. In the final third, we go and gather some evidence for Detective Renee Montoya so she can help us take down the Court of Owls. So sure, okay, off Red Hood goes, on his own, offline, to snap some pics. But when we return to the Belfry, every single knight has sent a separate email to her written uniquely by them with the same JPEG attached. You weren't there, Robin. Red Hood was. You were jerking off in your bedroom. Again, I despise Marvel's Avengers, but even that tumble dryer full of rot was able to give us AI heroes to join us on missions. You'd even pick your favourite Avengers to infiltrate buildings or take down bosses with you. Why is that system not here? Was it ever planned? Did the team just run out of time? Because I feel like Hero AI should have been one of the first things on the whiteboard in a game all about the Bat family teaming up to take down a shadowy group of villains. Oh. That's a oh. piñata. Oh. Yeah. She's blue. She's blue. Here's something I do like. Harley Quinn's straight jacket sleeves and the environmental design of her cell are just camp enough to keep up her sense of whimsy and the dark sense of humour that's encapsulated her characterization for decades. The gimmick with the helium balloon made me laugh, and the backstory surrounding her partnership with Batman is a unique twist on the character that reminds me of the 2017 animated movie Batman and Harley Quinn. Great film by the way, she sings in a bar, it's a great time. The framing of our scene has minor changes depending on who we play as. For example, she calls Nightwing Night Butt. Batgirl, Brat Girl, Red Hood, Dead Hood, and Robin, Bird Brain, which, seeing as none of these heroes are actually the superheroes we know and love, feels pretty insightful. But strangely, her reaction to learning Batman is dead changes depending on which knight is breaking the news. With Red Hood, she seems sad. With Nightwing, she seems frustrated. This is odd, because the news is the news no matter who's giving the news, so surely how she feels about Batman shouldn't change. After picking her nickname, every line of dialogue in this scene is identical. Her behaviour, how she responds to the knights, none of that changes. There are at least switch-ups to the cinematography. For example, Red Hood scenes are typically closer to him to reinforce his size and menace, but even these tiny shifts are rare. Despite how much the narrative director, Anne LeMay, really wanted us to think we could play the game four times and have four vastly different experiences. Quote, right at the beginning, we knew we were making a game with four characters and everything that that implies. We knew we wanted them to feel unique. Each has custom lines designed for them in each of our levels. My recommendation, as narrative director, is to play it four times so you can get the full experience. And she's right. Each knight does have custom lines depending on who's the focus of the scene. For example, here Red Hood will ask Harley, you were looking into something for Batman. What was it? And then Nightwing would say, Batman asked you to look into something. Can you tell me what it was? A real difference in feel, emotion, and stakes in every word. Anyway, following a punk cover of Livin' La Vida Loca that's grating as hell, but whatever, music taste is subjective, they can't all be Cat Empire, we get Harley's book of scribbles and take it back to the Belfry. What's inside is nonsense, borderline indecipherable, but Tim finds a picture of the penguin in the book, alongside a list of criminals who got out on appeal. In that list, he's the only one who served his full sentence. Time to find out what's really going on. 
43 hours and 51 nights into my second playthrough, I finally found an open world crime that wasn't a repeat of crimes I'd already solved in my first three hours. Illegal shipments are slow speed chases on our bike. Some criminals have hijacked a van and are racing it back to their warehouse. They drop bombs and Molotov cocktails on the road that we need to dodge, and once we pull up alongside the van, we can crash into the door, knock out the goons, and stop the crime. This is, all in all, a really solid open world activity. It involves the bike for the sake of variety. It doesn't just involve standing in an arena and punching some bad guys. There's a feeling of momentum and it necessitates Gotham's open world because we're moving through the map as the crime takes place. Good stuff, no notes. But it took me 43 hours and two playthroughs to find the bloody thing, and a crime like this never happened again. It got lost in a rotation of samey side activities at the same old locations. And seeing as we're about to meet the linchpin of organized crime, now feels like the best time to talk about Gotham's criminal underworld. Tell me why you served your time when your friends didn't have to. Do you just like prison? Hmm, someone's done their homework. Oswald Cobblepot claims he's turned over a new leaf after doing his time at Blackgate. We can't find any evidence that he's supplying Gotham's bad guys with weaponry, selling drugs, or hell, is even late on his taxes. But you know, and I know, and the Knights know that he's definitely up to something seedy. He's set up in his office at the Iceberg Lounge, a nightclub and monument to his ego and greed. And after knocking out his guards and kicking his door in, he tells us calmly to fuck off. So that's exactly what we do. No really, he pulls a Logan Roy on us, tells us we're not serious people, and tells us to come back later. He tells Red Hood, a vigilante notoriously known by Gotham's underbelly for hysterical violence and outright murder, to get out of his face, and Jason just shrugs his shoulders and leaves. The game knows we'd be gobsmacked by this too, because Penguin has in-game dialogue that naturally peters out the longer we hang around the room, eventually ending with him saying, Fine, I'll just ignore you until you leave. Somebody had to write that, ask the voice actor to say it, and then infuse it into the scene so that our exit and frustration would feel natural. But I know what you're thinking. Surely there must be a point to all of this, right? The game wouldn't make us waste all of this time going somewhere for no reason. The story must have some big moment that it needs us to focus on instead. Eh, wrong. This is padding because we are once again being forced to go out and do busy work on a nighttime patrol until the story is ready to continue. We need to dismantle Penguin's criminal operation so he takes us seriously. We've been so focused on Bruce's case that we've forgotten about going out on patrol, our knight gasps to Alfred. First off, I thought Penguin was crystal clean. How do we know about his super secret crimes, and why don't we ever bring him to justice if he is still running a criminal empire? Also, ring that bell because this marked the third time so far that the game has paused itself for us to go and do random side bullshit. So, random side bullshit it is. Let's stop some crimes. On paper, there are 15 types of premeditated crimes for us to engage with. It's the superhero fantasy on steroids, right? Out on patrol, feeling the rain patter on our cow, observing superstitious and cowardly criminals rob a bank from a nearby rooftop, planning our strategy. God damn, I love Batman. But these 15 crime types aren't really 15 crime types. They're six at a push. We talked about illegal shipments already, so let's count down the remaining five. Criminal Deal, Criminal in Hiding, Criminal Stronghold, Kidnapping in Progress, and Owl's Nests all give you the same objective. They're arena fights. Go to an arena, beat up some bad guys, leave. There's variation in the sense that Owl's Nests only have us fighting talons, and Criminal Deals have two factions warring it out, but the tangible thing that a player has to do in these scenarios is always the same. Illegal hack, prisoner transport attack, witness under attack, officers under attack, armed robbery, and armoured truck robbery are all protection fights. You go to a place, some bad guys are trying to break a thing or steal a thing, you protect that thing by beating up all the bad guys. The variation again comes in the form of the factions. Illegal hacks, for example, will focus on the regulator gang. Bomb disarmaments mainly rely on the Freaks Gang. They're stealth arenas, where we need to deactivate three bombs without being detected by cameras, enemies, or sentry guns. If you ignore the stickiness of the movement that forces you to expose yourself while you awkwardly line up with a hostage, they're awesome the first few times. Because there are, at least by my count, only five locations these will take place in, like train stations or the planetarium. The level design, especially in the planetarium, is open, with numerous vantage points to escape to and walkways to manoeuvre around. If this was an Arkham game where we had numerous tools and gadgets at our disposal to up some variety to how we tackle these spaces, these would likely be my favourite parts of the game. But they massively outstay their welcome because these locations are constantly recycled in sections like Hard 
Harley Quinn side quest, and there aren't enough options for the player to really capitalize on the level. It's like the designers created an Arkham stealth room for systems that are distinctly non-Arkham. I'm not going to go in depth with stealth, because to be frank, there really isn't much to talk about, but the whole setup feels shallow and limiting. Bird Brain and Brat Girl are the two heroes created with stealth and strategy in mind. Robin can do inverted takedowns Arkham style after unlocking it in a skill tree, and Batgirl can hack weapons and cameras after unlocking it in her skill tree, but we're still lacking in depth here. You can't cancel a silent takedown into an ambush takedown for speed. You get locked into the animation, even if you're spotted, which means there's no versatility or improvisation to how a stealth arena can evolve. The enemies don't dynamically change how they partner up or how they hunt for you. They just walk on a loop and then when they spot you, they all gather together in a big huddle. Robin's character proficiency tells us that he's a stealth specialist, but you need to pour skill points into his ability tree if you want to feel even a semblance of difference between him and, say, Red Hood. There's no resource management with Batgirl's camera hack. You can just hack everything free of charge, so you don't need to prioritize targets, meaning there's no next step to how we use her. Bomb disarmaments aren't the only crime type that prioritizes stealth. There's also organ trafficking, a great crime that also outstays its welcome. Again, my love of all things stealth and all types of games make these a personal highlight because it's not one note, there are steps here. We break into a warehouse, or a ruined building, or that one warehouse again, find an organ, unseal it from its cryo chamber, and then need to race across the city to Leslie Tompkins' daughter, Jada, a completely new character that's here for literally no reason. Why didn't they just use Leslie? Is she dead in this universe too? Organ trafficking gets points for novelty. The time limit adds a lot to the challenge, and just like with illegal shipments, the fact that the crime moves out of its arena and into the open world gives it pace and gravitas. You're not stuck in one location and then off to the next. Next, you're moving the crime out of the warehouse and across the city. Crime number six is a crime scene. I know I've said tedious a lot in this video, but the crime scenes aren't tedious. They're goddamn soporific. Often, crime scenes will be marked on our map with a red triangle and a white question mark. Where does the question mark lead, you might wonder? Is this a unique, dynamic event occurring in the world? Maybe a rogue is on a rampage. Maybe someone niche and cool from the comics, like Cornelius Sturck, a serial killer that eats his victims' hearts. Or Flamingo, a fabulous assassin that came out of Grant Morrison's Batman and Robin run. Oh, it's just another corpse to stare at. A fixed first-person angle makes is taking a murder scene. Someone, typically an emergency worker, has been killed, and there are five objects littered around them. Always five, never four. Don't even think about making it four, it's five, goddammit. And out of these five, one of them will be the clue that tells us where the killers are. For example, here's a crime scene. There's a corkscrew, some broken glass, a street tag, some blood, and some fingerprints that the game tells us can be traced to the financial district. Five guesses which object solves the crime. Also, while we're on it, can we talk about these detective moments? Because they're sprinkled throughout the main campaign as well, and there they're not just soporific, they're snore-worthy, practically refusing to let you figure out the solution for yourself. Self. Earlier, in the GCPD morgue, Nightwing investigates Kirk Langstrom's body. We need to find a sample of his biosignature, and just as you're starting to take in the scene, our hero says, Blood would definitely be handy for biodecryption. Good stuff. Let me tell you, if Batman's detective work was like this, he needs to revoke his detective card. WB Montreal's last Batman game, Arkham Origins, gave us case files that needed us to use detective mode to loop through a crime scene and trace the order of events to figure out what happened. I don't want to harp on too much about Arkham, because again, even without that comparison, Gotham Knights fails on so many fronts, but this development team is responsible for that system. The system that proved the Arkham series didn't need to rely on following trails of blood or tobacco. It could give us sincere beats to follow that required some level of deduction from the player. It was so cool that Rocksteady happily took it and put it into a couple of moments of Arkham Knight. Guys, this is your creation. Why not repurpose it for this game? To gain access to any of the crimes I've listed, we need to patrol Gotham streets, beat up and hoover up tiny red magnifying glasses like Spyro the Dragon collecting gems. They fill up a bar that maxes out at 12 crimes, and if we're feeling extra brave, that game loop can transition into interrogating goons to find premeditated crimes available that night. Sometimes, these random crimes won't spawn. Here's an empty alleyway where the loot crate is open and the enemies have already been knocked out. You might think this is to show that I was too late to the crime, but it's literally the first place I went when beginning that night's patrol. My problem with this, aside from the fact it's fucking stupid, is this is the game loop. We're not building to something bigger, more satisfying, or more interesting. You go out, beat up some thugs, suck up the magnifying glasses, also you can go out the next night, beat up some more thugs in a warehouse or a criminal stronghold, and suck up the 
magnifying glasses. It's an Ouroboros, a loop that doesn't expand or extend beyond this, aside from inflating some enemy health bars, sticking a random name above their head, and claiming that there's some major villain we need to take down. We're rewarded with resources and blueprints, and we'll talk about why that system is a cosmic joke in the next part, but there is nothing else going on. If the gear system was any good, which it isn't, and the combat had layers, which it doesn't, then sure, this game loop could be enough to carry the hours you will spend trundling through it, but those systems aren't here, so by the fifth or sixth night on patrol, I started asking myself why I was doing any of this. Oh, um, it's to grind, that's why. And here's the cherry on the big black bat cake. Warner Brothers have the mother of all gameplay systems sitting in their vault that can make all of this ten times more engaging. But we'll get there in a minute, our busy work is complete. Back to Penguin. The rich and powerful have been getting a free pass out of Blackgate for years. But you serve time. Why? They were favored. I wasn't. Favored by who? Having beat up some muggers, Penguin finally thinks we're serious enough to tell us what he knows. The Court of Owls is real, he says. They're watching our every move. Our knight doesn't believe him, the Court of Owls is just a bedtime story. If Batman didn't know they were real, they probably aren't real. Right? Penguin hints that we might learn more at the Powers Club, an old, eerie mansion on the Gotham Bay where the rich and powerful scheme away from prying eyes. The grandeur of this location purposefully separates the Court of Owls from the regular gangs we've been dealing with up until now, so before we head over, let's turn our attention to the Freaks, Regulators, and the Mob. Here's a question for you. Who do the Freaks work for? Towards the end of the game, we find out that the Mob, the Regulators, and the Freaks are all on protection detail for a Gotham judge. Why is this the case? Who heads up their individual operations to the point that they can be contacted for security? Come to think of it, this judge isn't corrupt, so why would she ask a criminal gang to protect her in the first place? There have been numerous mob bosses throughout Gotham's history. Penguin, Sionis, Falcone, Moroni, Thorn. Which one of these top dogs controls the mob? The Freaks seem to help Harley with her plans during her side quest, but aside from the fact that she's a wacky gal and they're a wacky faction, there's nothing to explicitly tie the two of them together. When they tie up hostages and plant bombs on them at a train station, what are they trying to achieve? There's no ransom demand, the citizens are just randomers, so it's not like it's a personal attack. There's a lack of overall characterization for each faction. The freaks are crazy and anarchic, but how do they feel about the mob? The regulators? The cops? What are their goals or their aims? Same goes for the regulators. They like their tech? Cool. Is there anything else at play here? To compare it, again, to WB Montreal's last game, we had a clear understanding of how Falcone's men felt about Penguin's men. We pick all of this up with incidental dialogue during side quests, main missions, and flying around the city. There's a turf war at play. All of our gangs are fighting with each other to carve out their little slice of Gotham in different ways, selling weapons, taking over radio towers, and so on. All of that is absent here, adding to how empty Gotham Knight's world feels when hopping to the next crime. Guardians of the Galaxy would fill the dead air with constant character chatter that helped flesh them out and keep us entertained. Arkham had the constant criminal babble that was some of the wittiest writing in those games. Spider-Man gave us J. Jonah Jameson's radio station that had hours of exposition and history-based monologuing that kept us in the loop. The knights do speak to each other, but it's the same platitudes. Cops on the way good work, etc. There is a news host who has news broadcasts, but we can only listen to them when we're in the Belfry. The criminals have a small handful of comments like how much they hate a fire alarm, but they're written to be isolated in the bubble of that moment, with no awareness of how the city is changing or questioning where Batman's gone. Aside from a couple of new enemy types and single sentence descriptions, crazy, techie, the mob, the criminality of Gotham lacks in personality and depth. And there's one way that the team could have fixed this. We continue our gameplay feature series by exploring Middle-earth Shadow of Mordor's nemesis system. Back in 2014, a little game called Shadow of Mordor from an obscure franchise called The Lord of the Rings or something released. Its flagship selling point was that it used something called the nemesis system. You might brutally burn a random orc during a battle and he'd flee in terror. Later, he'd come back stronger with a distinct fear of fire and a renewed vow of vengeance against us. This could escalate completely to the point where the orc rallied troops, became a general, headed up his own stronghold. It was revolutionary. Series like Assassin's Creed were ripe to steal it and herald in a new era of dynamism in how a game reacts to a player's actions. And then Warner Brothers patented it. No other game company could replicate the system. There are workarounds. Assassin's Creed has introduced its cult system that's just legally different enough, but until 2035, the Nemesis system is off-limits for any game studio not owned by Warner Brothers.
Warner Brothers Montreal is owned by Warner Brothers. <sighs> Take a deep breath, close your eyes, and imagine a Gotham Knights that uses the Nemesis system. You do a random act of crime, blow up a barrel that burns a thug. He gets away. You meet him again, but this time he's stronger, armed with a new weapon. You kick his ass and knock him out. The GCPD take him away, but oh no, some corrupt cops have released him. Now they're on his payroll. He's surrounded by stronger enemies. GCPD enemies, who don't even give us any XP and hit like a truck, so the challenge is heightened. Maybe he decides to join Freeze's cause, so now he has Freeze guns. Maybe the Court of Owls get their hooks into him, so he comes back as a Talon, hyper-engineered by the court to kill us, and with a vendetta against our knight to boot. You could lose yourself in this system, for hours. Maybe one nemesis villain could be doing a criminal deal with another nemesis villain. Perhaps they team up to try and take us down. Maybe they'd invade us during other random crimes, evolving from a street thug to a deadly assassin that tracks us while we're out in the city. Just take a deep breath and imagine what could have been. Instead, what we get is a disappointing open world grind fest. So as the knights saddle up to investigate the powers club, let's look at what all of that grinding is for. Let's talk about the garbage loot system. Colonel Kane. Sergeant Pennyworth. I'm sorry I had to push our meeting so late. Work never seems to stop in this city. Alfred goes out for an evening stroll with Bruce's uncle, Jacob Kane, who in this scene has light grey hair. Remember that, it's important. Nothing of substance happens in this scene. A mugger tries to threaten them and they stare him down, but the only reason this was written and plopped in here is so we can get a good look at Jacob Kane's shadowy, fascistic, brutalist headquarters and to keep him relevant. Kane's totally a good guy, right? Meanwhile, Robin infiltrates the Powers Club. There's a secret meeting tonight. Security is tight. Owl imagery adorns the walls, paintings, sculptures, rugs. If the Court of Owls is here, they're hiding in plain sight. It's a quick mission, leading deeper and deeper into the basement of the Powers Club, with secret bookcases, plenty of security systems to deactivate, and an owl puzzle in the cellar that is far too easy. We line up small statues to form the shadow of an owl on a wall. When we turn the piece the right number of times, a snippet of the Court of Owls nursery rhyme plays. This only plays when we've turned the piece the right way, so just keep jamming X until the audio cue. Talk about brain teasers, I'm teased to the max. Luckily for us, the Powers Club also has some secrets to find in the form of loot crates full of crafting resources. It seems like the Court of Owls are amassing piles of blue stuff and green stuff for their members to use. According to the Steam description, Gotham Knights is an action RPG, a term that, in 2023, means it's a game that will have you staring at your menu for half of the playtime, trying to make number go up rather than engaging with the mechanics that some poor combat designer has desperately tried to make interesting. It's a system explicitly designed to increase playtime. Enemies scale alongside you, so if you've managed to find gear that has a nice big power level, the power fantasy won't necessarily hang around for long. Your average mugger will suddenly become a level 28 powerhouse that constantly makes your knight feel like they're punching bad guys with all the strength of a dying fish. To the game's credit, you could just play on easy to skip the system altogether, and at launch, in my frustration, that is exactly what I did. But for this video, I play Gotham Knights the intended way. It's a parasitic design philosophy, absolutely everything comes back to making number go up. The active crime grind, the various looping side quests, the optional objectives, it all feeds off of the game's heavy, heavy emphasis on loot and gear and numbers. I spent hours staring at these numbers, figuring out its modding system, and trying to understand its resources and components to try and max out my character, waiting for the dopamine hit that never came, so god damn it, I'm gonna talk about it. Let's start with crafting. There are 15 crafting resources in total, dropped by specific factions and required for crafting new gear. These green vials are industrial solvents dropped by the freaks. Apparently it's an uncommon resource. This is a lie. Every freak will drop this and you'll be drowning in the stuff after a couple of hours. These green squiggles are organic composite. They are dropped by the Court of Owls. You get the idea. Different types of suits or weapons that let us use elemental damage like fire or freezing require different types of resources. 
For example, if I want Robin's epic level 28 cryogenic bow staff with pooper level of 439, I need the white rectangles, the green balls, the blue coke, and the purple spikes. But oh no, the purple spikes are only dropped by the regulators, so I need to go out and grind them out so I can afford to make this new sick upgrade. Can't wait, it's gonna be so much cooler than my level 27 cryogenic bow staff. What this system does is it fundamentally undermines feeling like a superhero or a vigilante. Half of the game is stopping active crimes, but we're not motivated to stop the active crimes because they are particularly interesting or because we care about Gotham's people. Our motivation isn't crime fighting or truth and justice, it's harvesting all of that sweet, sticky loot. I legitimately started skipping crimes that wouldn't give me what I wanted. I'd hear someone getting mugged, head over there to save them, and as soon as I realised it was the mob, not the regulators, I'd grapple away, leaving the poor sucker to their fate. Gaining new abilities has this problem as well. New powers aren't unlocked organically by following the main story or by defeating a boss like Mr. Freeze. Instead, they're unlocked with tiresome challenges that aren't unique, they're basically dailies. Every hero has one combat ability that can only be unlocked by defeating Talons, so again, I'd ignore every crime that wasn't the Court of Owls. In my play experience, the knights are all canonically selfish because they don't want to deal with this grind. You could argue that that's on me, but the game itself actively disincentivizes playing as heroes who fight for all. I'm just fighting to make my number go up. I will give props to the game because skill points are shared by the four knights. If Batgirl earns a skill point, so do the rest of them, which thankfully reduces the monotony. I just wish the skill tree was… interesting. Let's take Red Hood. For the cost of two skill points, we can increase Red Hood's chance of landing a critical hit by 10%. Oh, okay, that seems kind of… whatever, what else is there? Um. Oh, let's look at Nightwing. Hitting an enemy with a melee attack from a large distance increases critical chance and critical damage by 15%. Christ, okay. The idea that Batman's four protégés, the four heroes who will take up his mantle after his death, trained by him, get stronger through percentage and chance increases, flies squarely in the face of the kinds of heroes that the Bat family are. Batman is all about his discipline, his deliberateness, his precision and calculatedness. So why are the Bat family's skills mostly revolving around rolling a fucking dice for a random chance to do something. This isn't the way of the Batman, dick. Bruce would be very disappointed in you. We can't craft items in the field for immediate use either. Say I'm out on patrol, I visit Penguin, and he gives me what I need to make an awesome, exciting, badass, legendary. Level 32 Batarang. Oh, it's so cool. Look at it go. This is worth the hours of grinding to get. But oh no, I can't even use the damn thing until I've gone back to the Belfry, sat through a loading screen, gone into the menu, equipped it, fused some mods, installed them, and then then sat through another loading screen to get back out into the world. All of this is just here to pad out game time. What do you want, Oswald? Straight to the point. I like that about you. So, how's about a little partnership? This inability to roleplay in an action RPG extends to Penguin. After our first meeting, he starts providing side quests to us where Gotham's heroes help a crime lord take out his competition in return for crafting resources. I beg your fucking pardon. The Bat family have allied themselves with villains before, but it's always been through necessity. Not in a million years would any of these guys work for the Penguin to help his criminal empire. Jason Todd thinks they're all scum. In Under the Red Hood, he decapitated drug dealers. You think he'd work for an arctic pigeon? In World, Penguin is feeding us information about active crimes, but mechanically that's not the case at all. We need to find random hard or very hard crimes, and if we complete them then he gives us nth metal, the only crafting resource that lets us create legendary loot. So working for the Penguin isn't just an extra thing to do, it's a damned necessity if you want to get more powerful. Action RPG my ass, I'm not roleplaying as a superhero, I'm roleplaying as a bloody henchman. You've been doing a great job, pal. Thanks boss. Speaking of the Penguin. In the caves beneath the Powers Club, we witness our first members of the Court of Owls, Constance Cobblepot, the Penguin's mum, and the voice of the court, whose identity is hidden under a mask. But he does have brown hair, so remember that, it's important. Constance has asked for a bill to be passed into the United States Senate, showing us the far reach that members of the court have. They're not just in control of Gotham, they're in control of the entire country. Don't ask what the bill does, we will never find out, even though it sounds interesting and would help teach us more about what the Court of Owls' goals are, but she's not the focus of the scene. That honour goes to the voice of the court. The court cannot forgive your failure. You will atone with blood. Don't do this. I'll, I'll do anything. 
And you, Vernon, do not belong here. <laughs> The voice is the primary focus, our big bad to take down. He and an assembly of the court sacrifice an unnamed traitor, throwing him into a fiery obstacle course below. That's pretty sucky in its own right, poor guy didn't stand a chance, bet he wishes a superhero was here right now rather than one of Penguin's goons, but regardless, we survive the court's trap, and return to the belfry with a shiny brass key. The knights are confused as to why Batman never mentioned he was investigating the Court of Owls. A secret society so ancient that even he couldn't find evidence of their existence. It's quite the mystery. Jason talks about how he died, Tim is a little prick to dick and calls him stupid. You sure? You just forget they had playing. But none of them have any idea what their next step should be. This is a pretty common trope of these Belfry scenes where the pace of the music and the quick fire delivery makes it seem like the gang is working together to solve a mystery, but what is physically said doesn't lead to them figuring anything out. No new knowledge is learned or deduced here, and when we fade to black, there's no hook for where the story should go next. Jason states plainly, it's a key, and Barbara uses her brains, her wits, and her photographic memory to announce, let's find the door. Batgirl everyone, the brains of the operation. Inexplicably, our mission objective takes us to the Gotham Gazette. Inside, we find remnants of the Court of Owls and learn that they've been organising assassinations of powerful people in Gotham. And that is going to need to wait, because we're not done grinding for gear yet. You have acquired one or more duplicate blueprints. They will be turned into salvage instead. Fifteen words that will be repeated ad nauseum before the credits roll, because despite weighing its entire game loop on loot, that loot is generally sheer garbage. Boxes and chests are abound. Enemies drop blueprints like they've all been shopping at Star Labs, but the game really only has about six different types of gear that it offers us. Stun-based gear, flame-based gear, bioelectric gear, freeze gear, toxic gear, and critical attack-based gear. Oh sure, it'll be given different names, relating to different factions, outfits that protect us from the League of Assassins, for example, but this is hardly Borderlands or Diablo, where the constant rotation of equipment is varied enough to stay interesting. The elemental effects make combat look a little flashier, but it's only really the piss-coloured legendary loot that offers unique ideas and combinations, and even with hours of grinding, I did didn't unlock any of that stuff until the end game, so the main way you keep that number up is through mods. This is the mod screen. I don't think I need to say much more because what? But would you believe that the incongruous design is the least of its problems? We are highly encouraged to fuse mod chips together because bad guys shit them out at a rate of three per crime, so if you don't stay on top of this menu, it will devolve into white noise that you can barely parse. So you fuse four mod chips together to create one better mod chip. Can't be three, can't be five, has to be four, which seems unnecessary, but sure, whatever. The whole system's a cacophony of shite, so who cares? My expectation of fusing would be to take, say, four level 31 elemental mods, stick them together, and get a level 32 elemental mod. I've used up four, and I've gotten something better. That isn't what happens. Sometimes, inconspicuously, fusing four elemental mods will create a strike mod. Sometimes it'll create a critical mod. All I want to do is up the level and quality of my elemental mods, and suddenly the game swallows up all of the information I'm giving it and puts out a mod I distinctly would not want. This is like if Goten and Trunks fused in Dragon Ball Z and they ended up turning into Yamcha. Fusion nah. Like and subscribe for data Dragon Ball references, I'm here all day. I am convinced that this system is broken and even the designers don't don't understand what combinations work, because none of this makes logical sense. If you combine three epic mods with one rare mod, you'll end up with a rare mod. Sometimes the quality degrades from the fusion. Aside from mod customization, there's also suit customization. You can change the cowl, the colour scheme and the boots. Awesome, love this, but you can't customise transmogrified suits. So if I'm running around with a level 29 new knight suit for Nightwing, but I think the new knight suit looks garbage because look at it, I can change the suit to be Nightwing's Titan outfit. Which also looks crap because for some reason the game just hates Nightwing, but that's not the point. The point is after transmogrifying, I can't change the colour of Nightwing's suit. Maybe I want to give him his red New 52 colour scheme. No dice. This just seems unnecessary. What, can the game's engine not handle a customised skin? So like the first thing I do is Batgirl, and when I get into it and they introduce this, is go over like, what suits do I have? Oh, you have these Nightfall suits that are like, the more uh, iconic or, you know, what you think. And I put them in that. And they're like, well, when you put these on, you can't customize them all. I'm like, yes, that's the fucking point. 
I think all your stuff looks dumb. I want to look like this. You know what I mean? Also, yeah, you said it, guys. So while I'm mourning about bloody costumes, every character looks crap except for Batgirl. She's the only one with consistently cool outfits. Where's Red Hood's original trench coat design? Why are so many of Robin's costumes missing a cape? Why does Nightwing look like he lives in his mother's basement no matter what outfit he's wearing? Tim, especially, is best known for his Red Robin days. Where's the Red Robin look? No, don't start. This sham doesn't count. But hey, you know what character designs I quite like? The villains. So, let's put a pause on the trundling story, because for context, we are halfway through this critique and the Court of Owls have just become a plot point. Instead, let's look at the other rogues. It's time for Harley, Freeze, and Clayface. What you're seeing on screen right now are panels from First Snow, the Mr. Freeze tale from Scott Snyder and Jim's Tinney in the Fourth. You might recognize it because it's from the Night of the Owls storyline. This is an epic Court of Owls event that reaches its talons across Gotham, touching on many of the city's heroes and villains, including Catwoman, Penguin, the Birds of Prey, and more. You have no right to stand between a man and the woman he loves. Freeze barks. Victor, you and I both know that woman is not your wife. Batman replies. What this story does is it retcons Freeze. It takes his tragic story of a man just desperately trying to save his wife and makes it horrible. Nora isn't Freeze's wife. She was never his wife. The woman in the cryo chamber is Nora Fields, the first person to ever undergo cryogenic stasis. She's over 70 years old, and Freeze has deluded himself into thinking they're married. I know I'm not alone when I say I don't love this being Freeze's new canon. The Heart of Ice story that erupted from the animated series is beautiful, creating not just an empathetic villain, but a sympathetic one. Transforming that into this feels savage and ruthless. But as its own tale, if this was an Elseworlds storyline, I'd love it. I think it's a really interesting take on Freeze, shifting him from a loving husband to a rogue whose greatest enemy is his own mind. He's not well. I think this should have been the freeze we got in Gotham Knights. It's fresh, it's different, it separates him from the more classic Arkham version, and it pulls directly from a story connected to the Court of Owls. Because what we get instead is an empty husk devoid of any interesting characterization. I knew one of his protégés would come eventually. Bad news. I stopped your buggies from stealing Star Labs data. The Knights get a distress call from Star Labs. Mr. Freeze, alongside the Regulators, are staging a break-in. Freeze is trying to steal some gadgets and gizmos for his weather machine because he wants to encase Gotham in ice. Why does he want to do this, you might ask? Good question. We trace a clear path of carnage through Star Labs, so clear that it is the most obvious route through the level, but the game arbitrarily locks off a door until we scanned his footsteps. A trick the game will pull over and over again. We pick up from collectibles that this is a universe where he is the tragic Iceman most people know him to be. Before he died, Batman cured Nora's disease, unfroze her, and when Nora saw Victor had become a criminal, she abandoned him. So I guess he's still upset about that happening a couple of years ago? Maybe, but it's not fleshed out or explained in any of these missions. Gotham Knights Freeze has as much intrigue or depth as Batman and Robin's, but somehow the banter is more eye-rolling. Freeze can make weather now? Freeze can make weather now. Boo! But hey, credit where credit's due. We get a boss fight with Freeze nice and early into his mission chain. Some time passes, and eventually Freeze activates his weather machine at the top of Elliot Tower. Lightning flashes, ice crawls up the side of the building, it's the prettiest the game ever looks, so it's no wonder this was at the forefront of Warner Brothers' marketing efforts. As a battle, Freeze tests our ranged attacks and knowledge of how elemental loot works. Sort of. The only way you're going to put a real dent into him is if your weaponry is fire-based, but if you're watching the footage, you might think that's a lie, seeing as I'm shooting him with incendiary rounds and his health bar is creeping down at the same speed as the Flash in the Arctic. The, uh, the Flash is weak to cold. This isn't a Flash game, it doesn't matter. Freeze embodies a general balancing issue that'll occur across the game, but is specifically a problem here. My Red Hood is level 18. The suggested level for this boss is 13. Freeze is a sponge that hardly ever lets you get close for melee attacks, so unless you're gangbanging him with a friend, you're stuck with ranged weapons that do very little. The spectacle is here. The fight looks pretty. Freeze's visual design is pretty great with the mechanized armor and a varied moveset, but the combat is so limiting in so many ways that despite being a great boss on paper, he is a grind. Speaking of grinding, that's exactly what we're expected to do after defeating him. 
We use a disruptor that destroys his weather machine and boom, off Freeze goes to Blackgate. If you're playing as Red Hood, there's the essence of character growth for old Helmet Head because he's grumpy when he saved Freeze's life. But the game hasn't explicitly built up his murderous rampage as a plot point before now, so it's completely wasted. Barely an hour goes by before the Iceman breaks out of Blackgate again, but before that we're stuck interrogating a goon, destroying a hideout, and stopping two robberies. Let's update the busywork counter. You're done, Freeze. No more fireworks, or whatever the ice equivalent is. This... This was meant to be my greatest creation. Once we're done wading through the sludge, Victor activates a spider bot and tries to freeze Gotham a second time, so out into the bay we race. Why did Freeze build a spider bot? Fucked if I know, let's check the Gotham Knights wiki and see if it has any answers. Quote, this section is a stub. You can help the Gotham Knights wiki by expanding it. Well, good to know the game's five fans don't know either. The Spider Bot is a shameless co-op boss. You can defeat it alone, but due to its size and consistent ability to stun lock from a distance, soloing it is clearly not the intention. At least this battle doesn't have moves that actively disincentivizes getting up close and personal, so there are more options. But the context of the whole thing and the lack of sincere characterization given to Freeze makes what should be one of Gotham Knights' more memorable moments a wash. Let's walk through Harley and see if she fares any better. I used to be someone I didn't want to be. But now, I'm free. You can be too. Dr. Q is a name for Harley Quinn that coincidentally appeared in the Batman 89 spin-off comics, but to say WB Montreal took the ID and ran with it wouldn't be totally accurate. The issue that she appeared in was released in 2021, less than a year before Gotham Knights released. No, this idea was all Montreal's, a post-Joker Harley carving out her own path as a criminal mind in the form of an internet shrink. Kind of. After breaking out of Blackgate, she takes a leaf out of Gwyneth Paltrow's book and starts selling healing bracelets, supplementals, and... Goop Glow Morning Skin Super Powder. What the f- She's conning the people of Gotham by making them pay for hope. She knows none of this stuff works. She's a qualified doctor, but she's making a killing while doing it. It's a really interesting direction to take her in, leaning into her wackiness in a way that showcases the deep intelligence that lies underneath. Or at least that's what I wish I could say, because the second we crash her presentation at the Monarch Theatre, all of that solid setup goes right out of the window. I've got an explosive announcement just for you, she says with a wink and a glint in her eye. It turns out she plans to blow up a bunch of her fans who are giving her affection and money because, uh, wait, hold on, let me check the wiki again, maybe it has answers this time. This section is a stub. You can help the Gotham Knights wiki by expanding- Oh, god damn it! One thing that's kinda neat is that our infiltration of the Monarch Theatre changes depending on which night we play as. Harley knows we're coming. She's expecting us, and she set a trail of paint, balloons, and mannequins to lead us to the stage. If you're Red Hood, the mannequins will look like Red Hood. If you're Batgirl, the mannequins will look like Batgirl. It's a tiny thing, purely aesthetic. The mission structure is still a cardboard cutout, no matter what night strengths you're planning to pull on, but you gotta give points for trying. Deactivating Harley's bombs is one of the most infuriating gameplay sequences I've ever played in any superhero game. We're dropped into the theatre's basement and need to defend two brutes and one healer. As you try to hold them off, every 10 seconds a few bombs will arm that you need to sprint to and deactivate, which leaves the healer open to heal her friends of all the damage we've just done. Does that sound like it unnecessarily pads out this combat encounter? You'd be damn right. Does it sound like it'll leave you open to stun locking? You'd be damn right. Wow. Dr. Q invites all of her quinners to a wellness party. Wonderful. Throw up the bat signal or something. That'd flush her out. Despite our best efforts, Harley gets away, and the Knights learn that she now plans to inject her followers with experimental medical equipment that throws them into a violent rage. Good thing we deactivated the bombs or her brand would be tarnished. Once again, it's back out into the open world to do busy work and fight some freaks. Ding. So, while we do, let's get back to Harley's characterization. This is a woman who worked with Batman to try and rehabilitate herself. She was sent undercover into Blackgate Prison to do some criminal profiling for him, and we later learn that she did exactly this. She was an ally to Bruce. Then she broke out of Blackgate for reasons unknown, despite the fact the Knights would have just let her out once they knew she was telling the truth about being an ally. She re-established herself as Dr. Q to make a quick buck and gain some of that sweet, sweet branding. 
She tried to blow up herself and her followers for reasons unknown. She injected a bunch of her followers with some device that makes them lose all inhibitions and go crazy for reasons unknown. And in a few minutes, she's going to incite a riot across the city for reasons unknown and take over Gotham General Hospital for reasons unknown. A lot of reasons unknown in that list. Now you might be thinking, God, Monty, what are you moaning about? Harley's crazy. She's a crazy clown lady. Are you really looking for her plan to make sense? Yes. Having the word crazy in your bio doesn't wipe away consistent character motivation or reasoning. The Joker's crazy, but he has plots and plans that you can follow. Torture Barbara Gordon to drive her father mad. Pretend that he cut the faces off of Batman's friends to make a point. Drive Batman crazy in an asylum, and if that fails, pump a chemical into the water supply so everyone can be as monstrous as he is. There's always a goal, even if it's just to make Batman's day a little bit worse. I don't know what Harley's goal is. In an interview with IGN, Patrick Redding said, quote, Harley's coming not from a place of, oh, I've got to be zany, I'm your manic pixie. She doesn't need to be the manic pixie anymore. She has gotten to a point where she knows who she is. She has a very clear sense of what her identity is, and she's going to present herself in this much stronger, developed, supervillain way. Okay, so who is Harley, Patrick? Is she a reformed villain who helped Batman with the case before his death? Is she an ally who shares that information with the Knights when they ask for it? Is she an influencer who cons Gothamites out of their money? Is she a terrorist who blows up her fan base? Is she just Lady Joker who wants to chemically alter people to be as crazy as she is? Her final character design definitely leads into the Lady Joker angle. This would be an interesting take if she ever referenced the guy, or if the game was interested in exploring her aim of usurping the Clown Prince's legacy as revenge for being so abusive. Which, ironically enough, is one of her early motivations in the awesome Harley Quinn TV show. Deep inside Gotham General Hospital, with a riot outside, she says hello one last time with some brand new threads. Grease paint is smeared across her face, her hair is ratty, hurriedly cut. This isn't the Harley from the modern comics run who's deluded and zany but has a sense of class. It's a demented design that, in a vacuum, I really like. Harley's a mess. Batman's dead. Joker is wherever. It's like she's trying to find her identity but is clutching at straws. If the game tried to say anything with that, I'd argue it's purposeful. But with a gun to my head, I wouldn't be able to tell you how she went from this to this. What hurts most is she's the most captivating boss fight in the game, until she summons a bunch of goons to distract us. She has numerous unblockable attacks that we need to dodge. She can close the gap between us with speed and she hits like a truck, but her health bar isn't spongy. This is a boss battle that tests our reflexes and our dodge. It's brilliant. But suddenly I'm fighting the same freaks I'm battling in the open world. Suddenly I'm ambushed by mobs. Suddenly I'm not focusing on Harley's glorious animation. I'm battling the controls, the camera, and Fred the Freak's bullshit. Just let me fight the Batman villain game! Two down, one to go. And I'm happy to say that Clayface isn't just the best side quest, he's the best part of the game. I should have killed you a long time ago, asshole. I will make the same mistake again. Clayface is the only member of our trio who has focal, reinforced reaction to Batman's death. His side quest escalates in difficulty, flair, and sincere emotional resonance. But for all of the praise I'm about to throw at this questline, its opening is a drag. A small handful of muggings are reported across the city from faceless men, and we need to trawl about one of the districts to beat up five of them. Doing so, the knights figure out that the muggers aren't men at all, they are made from clay. This is suspicious because just a year before Batman died, he and Clayface fought each other in the Gotham Reservoir. Clayface fell into a turbine, supposedly dying, and Bruce never forgave himself. It was one of his big failures. This sample seems especially disorganized, like, like it's trying to be five things at once. Oh. Maybe it's because these pieces of him on their own aren't enough for him to stabilize into a singular conscious entity. <clears throat> you guys are doing your nerd thing again. Sorry. Barbara and Tim geek out as they theorize how Clayface's biology could have survived being torn to shreds. Jason and Dick drool and are like, English nerds, do you speak it? Even though they're being very clear. The Clayman has split into five pieces, Dick. What about that don't you understand, you man-child? It isn't until the gang find Clayface that the quest erupts with spectacle. An honest-to-god superhero chase carries us through the city streets as Clayface rumbles under the ground, bursts out of manhole covers, leaps over trucks. Suddenly, ramps that weren't in the city before are here for us to take full advantage of, and I feel like I'm playing a different video game. Catching up to Clayface, we see his tragedy in its purest form. He's been split apart, his consciousness fractured across different clay samples. He could still split his body apart at will, he could still essentially make copies of himself, but something has happened to his mind after falling into the turbine. He's hurt, 
and he blames Batman for that hurt, evidencing the fact he wrote his own movie script and is hiding out in the sewers trying to make a film that paints Bats as the villain of the story. Worse yet, his sense of time is skewed. He thinks he died just a few days ago, and when we tell him the truth, he calls us a liar and demands to see Batman. Just like Freeze, Clayface is a two-stage boss fight. The first section brings grunts in just like Harley does, but that's because the whole battle is engineered to test our handling of mobs. Clayface doesn't just send in some reskinned goons, he spawns them while laying traps on the ground and pummeling us into the clay. He gets away, but later we pick up his signal for round two, a pacey, varied, multi-stage battle in Gotham's reservoir. He lures us to the place of his death and then tries to exact his revenge with a titanic fight against a strong enemy that then transitions into a high-speed chase through the sewers, and finally, a final phase where he can shield himself from your stronger attacks and we need to rely on elemental strikes. My feelings about Clayface would probably change if the elemental attacks worked the same way as they did in the freeze fight, but they don't. It feels well balanced. Fire does what fire is supposed to do, and when the dust settles, his final words are simple and haunting. I just want him to be seen. <laughs> Good stuff. Gotham Knights needs a parry mechanic. It doesn't need a counter, it doesn't need to replicate the Arkham combat system, I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying is it needs to give the player the ability to, with careful timing, knock back an enemy's attack and then capitalise on that knockback. It sounds like I'm being pedantic, but we're going to talk about the punching in this section and trust me, pedantry is going to be necessary. Let's start with the basics. In an interview with Screen Rant, the game director, Jeff Eleanor, said, quote, The Knights are really, really different, and they take different mindsets to really master and get the most out of for each hero. Red Hood, obviously, is big and brutal, but he deals the most damage out of all the knights. Batgirl has the strongest damage per second. Nightwing is more acrobatic and is about repositioning himself. Robin's abilities are about returning to stealth quickly. All of that is technically true, but not in ways that are meaningful. No matter which knight you play as, they all have a light attack, a heavy attack, a light ranged attack, and a heavy ranged attack. Here's Nightwing's heavy ranged attack. Here's Red Hood's. Do you see a difference? Because I don't. None of them can counter or parry. All of them rely heavily on the dodge and timed attacks. Because of the erratic camera, sometimes zooming in on an enemy and sometimes smashing into walls, every knight is a one-to-one -one fighter. There's nothing like free flow here that incentivizes swapping between targets, or Spider-Man's ability to grab an object and swing it around him. On paper, the playstyle of the knights isn't that different. Because Red Hood's guns can move independent of his body, he's the only knight whose core abilities lead to a capability for crowd control, but again, because we're doing the whole action RP number go up thing, the only time you'll be challenged is if an enemy is spongy. And if an enemy is spongy, you don't want to focus on crowd control, you want to be a one-to-one -one brawler. So, no matter who you're controlling, that is the playstyle these basic functions trip into. Where the knights differ is in their special abilities. Again, kind of. This game has more caveats than recommending the Flash movie. Each knight gets eight momentum abilities which are supposedly unique to them. For example, there's Nightwing's Dart Storm that shoots darts in a widespread in front of him. Then there's Batgirl's Batarang Barrage, which shoots Batarangs out in a widespread in front of her. There's Red Hood's Mystical Punch, which breaks a brute's guard. And then there's Robin's Warp Shot, which breaks a brute's guard. Some of these abilities are unique. For example, Batgirl can summon a swarm of bats and then jog about while they latch to enemies and kill them. Nightwing can break down from the floor and we can slide him over to bad guys that kill them. Red Hood could drop a turret on the ground that will mow down any enemies that get in his way. This thing is overpowered to the point where I think it could kill Superman. Sometimes I just walk into a room, deploy it and leave and the active crime would end up solved. Oh, guard break abilities, by the way, are just flashier heavy attacks. Sometimes there's a 5% chance to inflict fear on a bad guy so they get a bit weaker or whatever bullshit, but that's not enough to truly want to sacrifice a whole momentum bar. Because the rate at which your bar fills up completely changes depending on what level you are, what level an enemy is, what attack you're using, what gear you're wearing, whether your dodge is a perfect dodge, none of this should have been the case. The momentum bar should have just refilled slowly over time. This is something the game lets you do if you pour the literal hours needed to get some legendary gear and are lucky enough that that gear has this very particular passive ability because again, everything goes back to the blood-sucking flea bag garbage loot system. Hmm. 
The Knights follow a trail of clues to a mysterious mine carved under Gotham. It seems like whatever team was working down here was trying to extract ore that contains traces of Dionysium, the chemical best known for residing in the resurrecting waters of a Lazarus pit. But that's not all that's waiting for us down here. The Court of Owl's lethal assassins, the Talons, are as well, and they encompass a lot of my problems with how the game's enemies are handled. GG Recon's review of the game gave it 3.5 out of 5 stars. In that review, they said, There is a long list of types of enemies in this game. You are kept well and truly on your toes with the various foes you face. With so many different opponents and differing tactics for each of them, combat never has time to get stale or boring. In the menu, and only in the menu, there is a long list of enemy types, but that list is bloated and padded with arbitrary changes rather than mechanical depth. Let's look at one of the ranged enemies, the Fire Starters. The regular Fire Starter throws Molotov cocktails at you, he does fire damage, is resistant to fire damage, and is weak to toxic. Later in the game, a new enemy type will appear, the Veteran Fire Starter that also throws Molotov cocktails at you. He does fire damage, is resistant to fire damage, and is weak to toxic. What's the difference between these two bad guys, you might ask? Well, one has a yellow jacket, and one has a brown jacket. Let's go back to the Talons. A regular Feral Talon does toxic damage and is immune to toxic, but it's weak to cold. It has an evade flurry and an armoured attack. But oh, watch out, here's a veteran Feral Talon which also does toxic damage, is weak to cold, has an evade flurry and an armoured attack. Uh, well this one has a gold belt buckle. In gameplay, Talons are fast and skittish. They require us to use our heavy ranged attack to knock them down. They cannot be hurt otherwise, but there's a chunk of problems with this. That ranged attack has the range of a weak as hell shotgun, so we need to get up close and personal if we want to reliably knock the talons on their ass. The problem there, just like the problem with the heavy melee attack, is that it takes what feels like an age to power up, and the talons are much faster than us, so they can either dodge out of the way or get a fair few hits in before we can use it. Then there's the fact that it doesn't always reliably hit the talons. Even if you're close enough to kiss them, there's a point in their animation where they can't be interrupted, even though this ranged attack is specifically designed to interrupt enemies when attacking. Every enemy, but especially the Talons, should have had a parryable move, because parries are a kinetic way to make a player feel reflexive and agile in a combat scenario. There's hardly any visual feedback when you're fighting specialist enemies. They just stand there and take it all. They're all either armoured, can block you, or can dodge every attack, so especially after you hit level 20, you'll spend a lot of these encounters swinging at thin air, or using that one unreliable move that could put a dent in that specific bad guy. The Brutes show this off best. Every faction has one, and these big hulks need you to break their guard with a heavy attack. Nightwing has a specialist leap ability that launches him into the air and lets him jam his feet onto the skull of a bad guy. But unless you've used a heavy attack, that move can sometimes be useless, despite the fact the enemy's head is obviously exposed. Because of that lack of feedback, the game heavily relies on health bars and numbers and immersion breaking damage indicators so we can stay on top of what's happening in a fight. Oh sure, you can turn them off in the menu if you don't want to deal with all of this bullshit flashing about on screen, but literally why would you? They're the only measure of success the game gives us. This is why people freaked out when they saw the stat indicators in the gameplay reveal. It's not because we all hate the concept of numbers, you would not believe the satisfaction a colour-coded spreadsheet gives me, it's because seeing mass bleed off an enemy typically indicates three things in a modern day AAA game. Number one, the dev's energy has been spent designing a garbage loot system rather than an interesting varied combat system. Check. Number two, enemy animations don't provide clear enough tells that we're doing any damage. Check. Number three, an over-reliance on generic elemental abilities like freeze or fire rather than designing a combat system that feels like it's unique to this game world. Check. So you're still alive. It's clear you don't understand your place. We earned our power. We shaped Gotham into the great city she is today. We are the protectors, not you. You're just bats. Collecting the Dionysium sample, we start to exit the mine, but not before the voice of the court arrives. He's pretty annoyed. This is their super secret mine full of precious resources that they're working hard to extract, and we're meddling around in it, headbutting talons and stuff. So here's what he does, right? You'll love it. A pure stroke of evil genius. He floods the mine 
That's right, the Court of Owls decide to just wash away all of their hard work and drown the excavation site, including the army talons that live down here. I guess they didn't need this Dionysium after all. Talia Al Ghul calls us up on the comms and tells us she knows all about the Court of Owls, but never told Bruce or us because she's the absolute worst. It turns out that the League of Assassins and the Court of Owls have been locked in a cold war for centuries, and she tells us we better be prepared if we're going to meddle in that war. Things could go wrong. Gotham could become a battlefield overnight. And let me tell you, if that happens, we are ill-equipped for war. The game's jankiness translates directly to combat. There's a heavy emphasis on timed strikes. It fills up your momentum meter, it increases your damage. That's all good and well, but you can't do timed strikes when you're getting stunlocked by gunfire from all angles, forcing you to dodge out of the way. There's a point in the mid-game where the types of bad guys you're fighting makes timed strikes completely worthless. Drone handlers that spawn drones that blow up, and drones that simultaneously Simultaneously shoot at you. Brutes that deal massive elemental area of effect attacks that linger long after the attack is finished, so you'll like just keep bumping into the after effect. But the surrounding goons aren't bothered by it. The League of Assassins are soon going to enter the fray, and they have brutes that fire mortars at you. Eventually, regular mobsters will come with grenade launchers that make parts of an arena inaccessible. Every time the knight gets hit, they react like a turtle rolled onto its back. There is so much time given over to waiting for stuff to happen in the event of taking damage, which adds to the overall sluggishness. Once you hit level 25, almost all regular enemies become armoured, so the only way you can get some hits in is by starting with a heavy attack. Remember, most of the special abilities can still be blocked by a bad guy's guard, so you will end up wasting momentum bars. In these cases, fighting turns into a case of heavy attack, do something else, heavy attack, do something else. The sponge factor is through the fucking charts. I am a level 24 Nightwing here and it is taking like a hundred hits to take some of these guys down. Fire starters and gunmen can lock onto us while we're in the air, which completely removes any sense of speed and agility that, again, is completely necessary to feeling like at least half of the Bat family. The idea that bloody Nightwing can't vault over an enemy is laughable. The only way to get the acrobat into the air is by using up a momentum bar. Perfect evades won't register if you're pushing the analog stick in a particular direction. You need to stand completely still and just press the dodge button. This is stupid. The Bat family, including Jason Todd, despite the fact this game's made him a brick shithouse, are supposed to be more flexible, more dynamic, and more athletic than Batman. In a game all about going out and becoming their own heroes, why isn't the combat system capitalizing on that? Despite the heavy emphasis on one-to-one -one fighting right down to the camera, we can't lock on to the bad guy we want to attack. We just have to trust that the game is targeting what we want to target. The the game will never target what we want to target. There are barrels full of elemental stuff that gives a big boom and freezes enemies or sets them on fire. The game straight up refuses to target them when you're throwing your ranged weapons, so the only way you'll ever be able to hit them is by holding the left trigger, zooming in, and pressing the right trigger. All of this comes with numerous delayed inputs and sludgy speed, and sometimes your ranged attacks will get stuck on the environment or in enemies that suddenly race into shot. Holy crap, I did not know how badly I needed to moan about this. I've got a whole list of little gripes I could cover here, like the fact we get health by stealing it from paramedics trying to save people in Gotham, but I think you get the idea. If I came to you and pitched a game where you play as the Bat Family, I wouldn't use the words loot, slow, stunlocking, elemental damage, no parry, no vault, or fucking damage numbers. I recognize a voice. The older woman is Constance Cobblepot, I'm fairly certain. And the others? More difficult to say. Maybe if I heard them in person. Returning to the Belfry, the Knights decide that they need to figure out who the voice of the court is. There's an upcoming memorial for Bruce Wayne at the Orchard Hotel. All of Gotham's big wigs will be there, so that's as good a place to start as any. The plan is simple. Break into a masquerade ball, dress in our vigilante gear, and eavesdrop on the conversations to see if we can get a voice match. Of course, Dick Grayson surely could just walk into the ball. Everyone's invited, and he's taken over as the head of Wayne Enterprises, according to some emails buried in the menu. He wouldn't even need a costume. He'd have every right to be there. It'd be less suspicious. Wait, no, hear me out. This scene isn't over. Why are we fading to black? Hello? Here is how Patrick Redding described Gotham Knights' open world in an interview with CBR.com. Quote, Talking to the world team, art direction, and all the people working on this game, 
We didn't want to go totally anachronistic, where Gotham is totally displaced in time, but you wanted to have this feeling of what would happen to an American city that just went bad sometime in the 70s or 80s. Gotham City. A den of thieves, a murderer's paradise, a city that's always minutes away from imploding in an ocean of fire, blood and cruelty, a hyper-fantasy bedrock of anarchy that exists in the daytime but comes alive at the night. With a clear enough creative vision, it's a setting that could be an art decor jungle, a city overwhelmed by its architectural past, an urban dystopia, a technicolor wonderland. It could be anything. So, with that freedom, WB Montreal decided to make an American city that just went bad sometime in the 70s or 80s. This is a visually uninspired, copy-paste sandbox overstuffed with repetitive activities. It's not been built to explore or uncover, it's been built to clumsily hop around and battle the frame rates with a pal. The coloured plumes of smoke do a lot of heavy lifting in the skyline, like this is a Gotham desperately trying to be a neon-noir cityscape, but aside from one well-lit street, that vision is suffocated by world design that refuses to have an identity. The most gothic things in Gotham are the bloody lampposts, the most accurate G-word to describe it is gentrification. Generic storefronts have been control C to control V on every street. Only one place does the people's laundry. Sometimes there are two coffee shops on one street. What's the idea here? Are you competing with yourselves? Good for the Merry Banshee though, it's one of three pubs in the city. Guess they've found a bit of success. Oh, but they better watch out. It looks like O'Shaughnessy's a real up and comer. It's plastered on the front of some apartment buildings for God's sake. The thing is, if we could bloody glide from the offset, this stuff wouldn't matter because we'd be in the sky looking at Gotham from a distance, so what would stand out are the distant plumes of fog and coloured lighting. But the fact we're so slow, the fact we're expected to use the bat cycle, the fact we have the laborious jumping grapple bullshit means it necessitates spending time looking at the detail of the world. And for one of the first $70 next gen only games to release, the detail simply isn't there. It's less about fidelity and more about curation. The billboards feel like they're stock images plugged into rectangles. Well over half of the city's advertising is pushing the all-new Finch Astral, a regular-looking car. What does this have to do with Gotham, the world? How does it contribute to the conceptualization of the city? There's no sense of chaos to the layout. In my Arkham Knight critique, I pointed out that Gotham should never be a grid-based city because that real-world design philosophy is all about slowing down traffic and creating a sense of order that is completely counterintuitive to the atmosphere of Gotham in any tale. In this game, Gotham is a grid-based city. Water tower assets cover almost every rooftop, especially in North Gotham. There are a handful of unique buildings, 40 in fact, but they're so lost in a crowd of repetitive brickwork and boxy architecture that the game turns them into bloody collectibles. I shouldn't need to work through a checklist to find interesting landmarks in Gotham City. That stuff should just be here. Even when the game tries to do something interesting, there's a sincere lack of consistency in the world's aesthetic. This isn't like when this exact studio designed Arkham Origins, with buildings crashing on top of each other to create a cramped skyline with piping and ducts poking out of the sides of buildings to convey poverty. This is your American city that went bad a few years ago with Art Deco and gargoyles bolted on top of it. The GCPD's interiors have an Art Deco splash of paint. There's a humongous, eye-catching cathedral at historic Gotham. Up in the north, it's a dead suburb that looks like it was lifted out of Saints Row. I don't get the sense that Alan Wayne, Bruce Wayne's great-great-grandfather, one of Gotham's most important architects, and a key figure in the comics history of the Court of Owls, established an architectural blueprint that modern-day Gothamites pull from in construction projects. I feel like WB Montreal built a bog-standard game city that we've seen before, or panicked and chucked in some relatively unique buildings six months later. At first glance, during the early trailers, I was really excited because I thought Gotham Knights was, rightfully, going to base itself off of the Joel Schumacher films. No, seriously, unfurrow your brow, I can see you. Batman Forever and Batman and Robin are covered in problems, especially that latter film. But one thing you can't say about them is that they're visually boring. Schumacher and the conceptual illustrators Matt Codd and Sean Hargreaves infused Tim Burton's original take with neon wonderment to quote, attract a new youthful energy. Look, Look at Two Faces Lair. Look how extra this is. If WB Montreal were so desperate to separate Knights from Arkham, this would be a surefire way to earn it a place in Batman's legacy, even if its story and systems stayed bland. There are beats where that style is replicated, 
Harley's quest line has its essence, but out in the world, it's the same typical shades of grey, brown and more grey that meet our eye. If Gotham itself replicated this sort of visual style, it would make the Court of Owls have a greater impact by contrast. They're old money, old wealth, old power, old archaic traditions, so visually comparing that true gothic architecture and extravagance with a flashy, saturated world outside would tangibly show off their ancientness. The Orchard Hotel is a great example of what we truly get. Creeping through the beige, dull, beige, corporate, beige interior of the orchard, we catch another glimpse of the voice of the court. He's now wearing medals. Ooh, I wonder who he could be. Perhaps he's connected to the only character in the story who goes by the title of Colonel. In this playthrough, I was Red Hood. We follow the voice through the hotel, watch him play four notes on a piano that activates a secret lift into his lair. But for some reason, Red Hood doesn't know how to replicate those four notes. We just watch the bastard do it. I know what the piano sequence is. Why doesn't Red Hood? Oh, that's right. Padding. And even though I didn't mention it, we had to do some open world busy work before going to the Orchard Hotel, so let me add a number to the counter while we're at it. Well, hopefully finding out the voice's secret identity will make all of this worth it. The only one hiding behind a mask is you, Mr. Todd. Jacob Kane, what? This reveal fails on three levels. Level one is its predictability. Jacob is the only new male character we've met in the story so far. It literally couldn't be anyone else that we've met already, aside from Alfred or Penguin, and obviously it's not going to be either of them. When he meets Alfred in the street, he apologises for needing to push their meeting so late. This is right after our knight runs into the voice at the Powers Club. Level 2 is how they try to conceal that predictability. Jacob Kane's hair jumps from grey to white to dark brown, and the voice of the court has that same inconsistency. Though, to be honest, I don't think this is on purpose. It's likely the game rupturing under the weight of Batgirl's cake. Level 3 is the real issue. Jacob Kane has no on-screen relationship to any of the knights. He's in two scenes prior to this. One is a pithy speech during the opening cutscene, and the other is a brief chat with Alfred. Aside from that, he never appears again. The only reason you wouldn't suspect him as the voice of the court is because you'll likely forget he even exists. The voice's identity doesn't need to be some grand reveal. It isn't in the story that spawns them because the voice is just some guy. We'll talk more about how the court is depicted in the next part, but pinning the mystery on the identity of the voice is a foul ball that, to be fair to Gotham Knights, keeps occurring in adaptions of this story. The court of owls is legion. You cut off one head and another will grow back, which reinforces how tight its grip over Gotham is. Pinning their narrative to the head of one guy undermines that. With his identity Identity exposed, Jacob starts twirling his moustache. He knew Bruce was Batman. He knows that Alfred helped him. He knows who each of the knights truly are. But before we can take him on, we're rudely interrupted. The League of Assassins arrive, cutting their way through the hotel. The war for Gotham's soul has begun. Owl versus Assassin versus Bat. But never mind all of that, because this is the part of the game where we unlock bat cycle races. So, let's talk about the open world side missions. The city might look like a husk, and feel like a husk, and sound like a husk, but if it's got interesting stuff to do, maybe that'll carry it. The drones only drop their shields when they stop in a station. And done. Congratulations, you have your pilot's license. Oh, outside of the active crimes, which eventually transform into an eternal cycle of Lovecraftian proportions, we can categorize the side activities into five types. Unlocking fast travel, races, planting security footage, dailies, and collectibles. Let's start with fast travel. Lucius Fox has designed a new glider that'll let us drop to key points in the city, but if we're going to access them, we need to deactivate the GCPD's drones that patrol through the skies. What this means is we've got to stand on a rooftop and slowly stare at a drone as it slowly hovers through the air. Does that sound boring? Because it gets worse. After doing this once, Lucius gives us a ring and says, oh no, now the drones have a shield while they're in the air. So we have to stand next to a recharge point and slowly wait for the drone to dock so we can slowly stare at it some more. This will happen an average of three times per fast travel point. How did this make it into the game? There are elements of Gotham Knight's design that only really make sense if you believe it started out as a live service game and then quickly course corrected after Marvel's Avengers proved that that was as fun as a brain hemorrhage. The crafting, with its mess of different currencies. The way you need to grind through tedious garbage to unlock flashy powers. I don't know why the fast travel system was designed this way. There have to be dozens of quality 
quality tests that come up during the production of a game. Feedback from QA testers, feedback from fellow developers, feedback from Warner Brothers producers. Are you sincerely telling me that everyone played the bit where you stand still for upwards of three minutes waiting for a drone to land and said, damn they're gonna love that. There isn't a single redeeming quality about this side activity. Next. Ouch. Yeah, I'll do that differently next time. There are three types of races in the game, the bat cycle races, the cash races, and the knighthood races. Each of these are… fine, rewarding new skins for the bat cycle, but they expose the sticky movement, the dissatisfying glide, leap or teleport, and the myriad of bugs that still buzz around in the game. I would complete a cash time trial just to have the game not register that I had completed it. That meant I didn't get the all important goot, but also meant that the cash was locked off. I couldn't try the race again until I went out on patrol another night. Next. Mr. Wayne! We receive an automated email from Bruce Wayne. An alert has pinged that means some people are googling his name and Batman's name together. We need to break into a set amount of stealth arenas around the city and plant this footage of Bruce in the Iceberg Lounge to throw them off the scent. I like these a lot in theory, but as soon as you unlock Batgirl's ghost ability that makes her undetectable to sensors and cameras, they fundamentally lose all of their challenge. You just waltz in, interact with the console, and waltz out meaning what could have been intense, interesting stealth challenges are now busy work. Next. Gotcha. The city is riddled with collectibles. I've already talked about the historic landmarks, but there's also batarangs, graffiti, audio logs from Bruce, Court of Owls murals, and pages from the Historia Strigidae, a book detailing the history of the court. An email from Nightwing tells us that the batarangs could be fun parkour challenges. Most of them are sitting on water coolers or rooftops. The graffiti is pretty, I guess. There are 12 in total, and at first I thought the pieces might detail beats from Batman's history in Gotham, but that's not the case. They're just bits of art that have been glued to Gotham's architecture. The Court of Owls murals give us resources specific to crafting the admittedly cool Talon costumes for our knights. But in my second playthrough, there is a little problem with that. The bloody collectibles bugged out. I collected 41 of the 42 Historia Strigidae pages, and when I came to the final location, the little hole was there waiting for Batgirl to stick her hand into, but there was nothing inside. Nada. And I know I didn't come here before because, full disclosure, I was using a guide. The only way to find the locations of the pages is by stumbling over chalk triangles in the world. Damn right I was using a guide. Two hours this took me, and when all was said and done, I couldn't finish the book or unlock the fucking outfits. As for the pages themselves, they're pretty neat. They give us the lowdown on the various families engaged with the court, the cobblepots, the canes, making a careful point to flag that the Waynes were never involved with them, never ever, but the writing, just like elsewhere in the game, is clumsy. There are scraps and scribbles written on the back of some of the pages that document a personal story of paranoia, but even with all of the pages, we never find out who wrote the book. The Court of Owls comics storyline offers up a perfect short story that could and should have tied to this. There, we can read through the letters from Alfred's father as he tells of how the court haunted him. Why not make Jarvis Pennyworth the author? Why not offer a moment of reflection for Alfred that his father never told him about the monsters hiding under Gotham's basement? At first, I didn't want to believe it. But after that shock came hope. He's still driven by a sense of justice. There's still a part of him I can recognize as Robin. He's talking to me, but he's so angry. That issue translates to Bruce Wayne's audio logs, the only way that character history is explicitly taught to us, and even then, it's limited as hell and some of these absolutely should have been reflected in the main storyline. Bruce documents his years as Batman with tiny gems hidden inside that are wholly relevant to Dick, Babs, Tim and Jason, similar to how the city stories were used in Arkham City and Arkham Knight. The key difference is Knight and City had a million threads to focus on and its wider world building was etched into the writing of its story and the design of its open world. Gotham Knights is barren, wasting time with batarangs and graffiti. The audio logs tell us about Bruce's first meeting with Batgirl, working through how concerned he is that she doesn't directly work for him. We learn that he told Jim Gordon his true identity a couple of years into his career, and Jim was a core mentor in his journey to becoming the world's greatest detective. We hear his pain after Clayface fell to his death in the turbine. He talks about the day Batgirl was paralyzed, but frustratingly doesn't mention exactly what happened to her. Barbara was paralyzed because she was trying to help me. 
Okay, so the killing joke didn't happen in this world then? Because in that story, Joker doesn't shoot Batgirl, he shoots Barbara. His attack has nothing to do with Batman and everything to do with trying to break Jim. What happened here? The audio logs confirm that Ace the Bat Hound is in this world. What the hell happened to Ace? Did he die when Wayne Manor blew up? Some of the best writing comes when he talks about a dream he had about Dick, reflecting on his feelings about the first boy wonder going out on his own. The knights, presumably, get to hear these audio logs because it's them collecting them. Why don't we ever get to hear how they react to them? Next. Hi, I'm Robin. And you are? If I don't need to know your real name, you don't need to know mine. I got grandkids to think about. I was going to 100% complete Gotham Knights, and then I realised that that is literally impossible. The game just keeps churning out more dirge and dailies for us to complete. An endless pile of shit to wade through. Good stuff. This is David. David works for The Watch, a neighbourhood organisation that tells us about crimes in the city. David is introduced to us when he tries to get a minor drunk. David and his colleagues Charlotte, Oscar, Toshio and Madame Palomares tell us to undertake tasks like stop five crimes in historic Gotham, and in return we get those sweet resources and XP. These missions rotate. Nothing unique or special ever happens. There's no furthering of the Watch's story, no conspiracy to unravel. The same goes for Renee Montoya and Jada Tompkins. They're dailies to tick off and grind through. Lucius Fox gives us dailies that focus around crafting, like fusing mod chips together or crafting epic gear. But Big Daddy Penguin says we only work for him, so sorry Lucius, I've got a new master now. You might be listening to all of this, or worse yet, looking at all of this, and thinking, that doesn't sound fun, that sounds exhausting. And it is. It all contributes to the repetitive, tiresome, slobbering grind for loot, rather than introducing missions that are love letters to the Bat family's comic book histories or character development. There is so much missed potential in the sort of short stories you could tell in this city, with the Court of Owls as the villainous backdrop, and as we jump into the next part of the game, you will see exactly what I mean. How's the file and Colonel Voice going? I've got enough evidence to lock Kane up for years. <laughs> Elena was one of the first names on my list. She's gone into hiding. A judge doesn't just disappear, even in this city. I'll ask around. See if anyone's got oh, a I'm so tired. I'm not going to bore you with all of the busy work that happens between the Orchard Hotel and confronting Jacob Kane. Just know that we need to do a total of six active crimes like beating up corrupt cops or interrogating freaks to find a judge. The point of all of this is that we need to get Detective Rene Montoya on site. The Knights could go up and beat up Jacob Kane right now, but he's married to the Commissioner, so if we don't have some legal backing, it'll all be for nothing. The plan is to get evidence of the Court of Owls' evil plans, which are... um... What are they trying to do again? If we're playing as four cardboard heroes, we're fighting paper villains. This is not the Court of Owls, not the court that fans were so excited for when it was revealed, and this is a piss-poor representation of the multi-layered story that spawned them. No new dimension is added, in fact, dimensions are taken away, and the anthology's worth of missed potential that surrounds this narrative is the most heartbreaking part of the game. So I'm dedicating a whole section to how the game has adapted the Court of Owls. 2011's tale is a shockingly personal story for Bruce, Alfred, and the Bat family. It's not just the idea that there's yet another secret society crawling around in Gotham's walls, it's that it's a secret society that directly touches numerous members of our colourful cast, drives Bruce paranoid, nearly breaks him, makes him doubt his allies, and eventually lays siege to his home, all because he poked his nose into some old cold cases. It's not like they've got some Machiavellian plan that has to be stopped, it's that they are the Machiavellian plan. Their very existence is dangerous, but the story we're given is one where they launch a direct, personal attack on the Batman. The court are drawn with sharp edges despite the curvature of their masks. Numerous trippy panels paint them as a monstrous cult. The talons are vicious, savage, and terrifying, not only enjoying their eventual hunt, but reinforcing with every encounter how ill-equipped Batman is for the size, scale, and ferocity of this organization. The Court of Owls is creepy, not just in a primal way, but in a way that taps into our modern fears of an elitist class of people that hate us, mock us, and could extinguish us with a snap of their fingers. The class divide of Gotham is referenced over and over again, eventually becoming the through line of the story's epilogue, where Bruce fights an obsessive orphan that claims he's his long-lost brother that grew up in poverty. That translation is lost in Gotham Knights. 
The game's creepiest moment is the Powers Club because it's where we finally get to see a large group of them torturing and tormenting someone. But that scene doesn't last long and the focus is the voice, not the court itself. There's a chilling scene in the comics where a group of them bray and yell over each other, auctioning ways that Batman should die until eventually a masked child gets the final say. Break his neck, take his feet, bleed him! The rich of Gotham scream. Hurt him more, a girl says, clutching her doll. But in Gotham Knights, the court seemed pretty content to mind their own business for the majority of the story. It was Ra's al Ghul who killed Bruce. The court were just a post-it note in his fridge that the Knights are investigating so they don't have to mourn him. The court kills Kirk Langstrom at the start of the game, which is the only crime we report to Montoya because again, the majority of their screen time is spent skulking around in caves and secret clubhouses, not really doing anything. I know it ain't worth much to say this, but... It was either you or me. The only time the court makes a move against the knights is when they lock one of us up in their labyrinth. They set up Penguin as bait and he tricks us into running to his rescue. Don't worry boss, I'm coming. But of course, the penguin is a baddie, so he betrays us. Oh, who saw that coming? The court knocks us out and whichever knight we're playing as awakens, in a nightmare. This labyrinth is one of the more interesting ideas that the game has, and it's still a weak version of something in the comics. This experience is something that Batman goes through himself. For two weeks he's running through these halls, inhaling fear toxin, blinded by the flash of cameras taking his picture, tracing his madness as talons keep leaping out of the shadows, slicing him and leaving him for days before coming back to cut again. With every torture, every attack and every step into madness, the reader is forced to keep spinning the book around so we can follow him, to the point where for a few pages we'll be reading the story upside down. Our knight is here for 15 minutes. They dodge some spikes, solve an owl puzzle and fight a talon. They there's a really cool incorporation of the photograph idea from the book where every time we die it's immortalised as a picture on the wall. Depending on who you're playing as, there will be one or two hallucinations specific to your character, but the game's determination not to give specific verbal histories for our heroes shines through worst of all here. This is a maze that showcases a character's worst fears. You'd think for Barbara and Jason we would at the very least hear a distant manic joker cackle to flag to us that the trauma he inflicted on them is a burden they have to bear, but no, no, we can't say the J word, so don't speak his name. Barbara's paralysis was just another day and Jason's murder didn't bother him, which would be a fair argument to make if his resurrection wasn't his only character trait. It's down here that we learn how the Talons are created. It turns out that they're old, dead warriors with Dionysium and Lazarus pit juice running through their veins. That's why the court was mining the mineral, that's why they're so hard to take down. And it's with the Talons that my biggest gripe with the court shows face. Red Hood, the court of ours has sentenced you to die. Gladiator Talons don't exist in the comics. They're just here so the Court of Owls have a brute enemy type. That's whatever, not everything has to adhere to the comics. Again, messing around with the characters in fresh and exciting ways is one of the things that makes adapting a story so interesting. But gladiators are the only Talons that speak. Why is this a problem, you might ask? Well, in the story, the iconic line, the Court of Owls has sentenced you to die, is a line that all of the Talons state before assassinating someone. It's a final blood-curdling goodbye, an acknowledgement to the victim that the Court of Owls exists and it's about to kill you just because they want to. It strengthens the Court's viciousness, their wide reach and their cultish demeanour because every single Talon says this before executing someone every single time. It paints the Talons as slavish. In the story, the Talons contribute massively to the class divide angle. During the Night of the Owls arc, where the Talons move out under cover of darkness and try to kill numerous powerful figures in Gotham, we are given deep backstories for a handful of the assassins, and we learn that many of them are incredibly tragic. Slaves sold to the court, or orphans of war, or children stolen away from Haley Circus, the place where Nightwing was raised. In fact, that is a whole part of this story. Nightwing was supposed to be a Talon. He was supposed to be sold to the court and transformed, but Batman took him away first. This meant that his childhood friend, Raymond McCreary, was sold to the court instead, and just before the Night of the Owls, he comes to Gotham to take his revenge on Dick. It's 
it's a bloody brilliant story that sounds like a bloody brilliant side quest that would be a hundred times more interesting than stopping robberies for the fucking watch. But the speaking also adds to the creep factor. When the Talons lay siege to the Batcave, breaking in, they goad Bruce and Alfred as they retreat to the armory and block themselves in. They enjoy the hunt, the blood, the violence, because they've been manipulated into enjoying it. They make hooting sounds when they're riled up. They mock their prey. None of that is here either, because the majority of the talons that we battle are feral talons that just occasionally screech. Oh, and you know how we were talking about Freeze earlier and how the game doesn't seem to know what to do with his story? Well, let me tell you, in the comics, the Court of Owls steal him, force him to teach them his cryogenic formula so they can keep the talons on ice, and he is so rattled by the experience that he freezes up a tower, holds some people hostage, and threatens to kill anyone who comes near him. I'm not saying this is a silver platter, people, but come on, it's at least a brass one. The labyrinth wasn't just meant to kill us. The court wanted to get in our heads. It might have worked. Despite the fact just one of the knights was held hostage in the labyrinth, all of the knights seemed to be shaken up and claimed they were the one who was kidnapped. Christ, even though Penguin betrayed Red Hood, he apologises to Nightwing and explicitly references betraying him if we go back to visit him. At least he still gives us our loot for stopping some crimes. No hard feelings, Chief. Can I have next Monday off? Tim wonders if it's okay to kill Talon, seeing as they're just zombies with no interesting backstory whatsoever, and Nightwing is like, Whoa, bro, Batman had a code. No matter how tough it gets, we won't break it. Um, two things to that. Number one, no dick. I would buy the whole no killing thing if the Talon's bloody spoke, but the feral ones are fair game. They're basically spasming muscle and sinew. And number two, please remember this insistence that Batman strictly never kills. We will come back to it later. Eventually, the time comes to go and take down Jacob Kane. This might feel rushed, but that's because I'm cutting out so much busy work and active crimes you wouldn't believe. Ding. With our escape from the labyrinth, the court decides to just send the Talons out on a rampage across Gotham. This, again, happens in the comics, but it feels like a child's tantrum when it happens. Batman got out of the labyrinth, and we see the court mourn the loss of their Talons. Their plan is just to burn Gotham to the ground so they can wipe out Bruce Wayne. Again, it adds to this sense that they're children with too much power, wealth, and influence, engaging in laughable rituals that are so infantile that it adds to the creep factor. Even though hundreds of Talons are now out in the city, they're still after specific targets in the court's hit list. In Gotham Knights, the towns are just like hanging around alleyways and helping court members break into cars. The Court of Owls is Gotham's worst kept secret. Not a whispered word of them is said, the old nursery rhyme goes. Aye, except they just leave their masks lying around in public and gangs of the fuckers will just hang around a judge's house. One of the key parts of the Court of Owl's tale is Batman slowly unearthing the owl's nests around the city. Specifically, these nests are in the bases of old Wayne buildings with histories that have been rewritten by the court. As the saying goes, owls don't build nests, they steal them, and that realisation haunts Batman. The court is literally everywhere, how on earth is he going to stop them? In Gotham Knights, we don't have to worry too much about that. There are at best four owls nests in the game, and they're just empty sewers with like five enemies hanging around. They're less like owls and more like cockroaches, because we will go to nest one, kill some talons, wait a couple of nights, and then go back to nest one to kill some more talons, because the active crimes reuse their locations, and that is all that the owls nests are. Talon combat arenas. The environments aren't interesting interesting, the enemies are the same kinds we've seen before, and the whole thing is just here to grind so we can unlock a special ability. Take your best shot. You get one. You know, I would, but I just had my nails done. The siege on Jacob Kane's headquarters is an anticlimax. The knights reveal their secret identities to Detective Montoya, a parallel to how Batman revealed his secret identity to Jim Gordon all of those years ago. An infiltration into Colonel Kane's fascism tower really feels like it should have been an ultra mission specifically designed to bring in all of the knights working together. But in reality, we'll do what we've always done, Pinky. Choose our knight, open some chests, and fight through some combat arenas. The irony is that in a mission that is supposed to conclude an epic Court of Owls tale, we're mainly fighting regular security who are unfortunate enough to be on guard duty tonight. There are like six Talons in the basement, and the eventual introduction of the Hunter Talon enemy type before we get to Kane, but none of this feels very creepy cult court. It feels like a military base, because that's exactly what it is. There isn't even a boss fight to tie a neat bow around the whole thing, it ends with a plop, not a splash. And the worst part is confronting Kane is almost identical for every knight. 
They all comment on the submarine. They all refuse to punch him in the face. Yes, even Red Hood. They all listen patiently as Kane vows to escape no matter what, with identical delivery which tells me they didn't film this scene four times like Wilson Wee and Anne LeMay claimed, they just slotted the knights in one by one. Of course, that anticlimactic feeling might be on purpose, because despite all of the marketing and all of the hype, Gotham Knights isn't a Court of Owls story. I can Italia. It's a Talia al Ghul story. At the time of writing, Gotham Knights had two updates, called Heroic Assaults. One features the alien Starro, and the other is about Harley, Clayface and Mr Freeze breaking out of Blackgate prison. It's a raid mode where you monotonously work through numerous levels in online co-op to stop- No, sorry, I'm not, do I'm not doing it. The video's long enough, we're just gonna do the ending. The individual structural beats of Gotham Knight's campaign lack all sense of momentum. It's a surprise that we stop the Court of Owls so quickly. In the end, they make up about a third of the story and are diluted by the game's insistence on making this Italia Al Ghul tale. But the level narration is a victim of this sluggishness as well. The best way to illustrate this is by letting the end of the game speak for itself, so here's how the last two hours of the game play out. Jacob Kane lies dying in the streets. Gotham's media snap pictures of him as the light leaves his eyes. His wife, Commissioner Catherine with a C. Kane, closes her eyes with frustration. But our hero doesn't hang around to watch any of that. Talia Al Ghul assassinates Kane as he's frog marched out of his headquarters. We frantically dash across rooftops, or hop across rooftops. It is nice of her to wait for us at checkpoints, seeing as the traversal system is so shit. Talia reveals that she lied. She was always working with the League of Assassins. We just needed to uncover the voice's identity and get him out in the open for her to kill him. Now, with the Court of Owls scrambling, the League of Assassins can get to work purging Gotham, raising it to the ground, etc, etc, League of Assassins bullshit, the same plot they always do. This is supposed to act as our 11th hour twist. Talia was the baddie all along, oh no, what a surprise, but all it really does is expose the goofy lengths she went to to try and convince us that she wasn't working with the League. Less than an hour before this intense rooftop reveal, our knight will find her battling the League of Assassins. So what, did she choreograph this with them just to convince us she's not working with the League? Okay guys, I'm about to call Batgirl, get your swords and pretend to fight me when she arrives. Everyone is raging about Talia's betrayal. No one more than Jason who decides to fight the air, and whoops it's time to ring that bell again because it's time for some busy work. The League is attacking our allies. This is a plot point from the Night of the Owls comic that WB Montreal have taken away from the court and given to the League of Assassins. Really spitting on their corpse here, guys. Lucius is involved in an illegal hack, active crime, while Montoya and Tompkins are involved in two separate witness protection active crimes. Again, the game pretends that this is all some epic part of the main campaign, but it's just reskinned crimes. The strangest thing about this is that even though three of our allies are in danger, we get called back to the Belfry after helping just two of them. So I guess we're just gonna let Jada Tompkins die then? Okay. Whoa, that's a lot of power that's been siphoned. Not necessarily definitive, except... Except? The power was diverted... here. Isn't Arkham empty? We track Talia to Arkham Asylum, where, on my first playthrough, the game crashed out of sheer embarrassment, but once everything resets, we get to explore the dusty halls of Amadeus Arkham's legacy. Exploring the Asylum shows off just how limited the variation in Gotham Knight's story is. Levels are separated into two types of gameplay, combat arenas and artificial reality sequences. Walk along a corridor, press X, walk back along the corridor. Sometimes we'll be forced to scan something in the environment to progress, even though the route forwards is obvious. Earlier in the game, deep in the mine, there's a part where we need to scan a bunch of objects in a room, but two of those objects are the same thing, a piece of ore that Dionysium's been extracted from. It's hard not to feel like whoever designed the missions were just going through the motions when mapping out the beats for each dungeon. Visually, the asylum especially is quite pretty. Vines, mould, dirt and rubble give us a hint of an asylum
asylum that tormented its patients, but because it's such a short level and because the game is afraid of developing any form of detailed history, we don't learn much about what happened here. We know Hugo Strange and Harley Quinn worked here, a handful of prison cells tell us villains like Professor Pig and Harvey Two-Face are established characters, but that's all the information we get. Why was this universe's asylum shut down? How did Bruce feel about the treatment of the patients? Written outside the building are the words, it won't matter. It feels like a cry for help from one of the environmental designers. Maybe it's something they were told while desperately trying to infuse the levels with some sense of variety and dimension. We learn that Kirk Langstrom was secretly working for the League of Assassins the whole time. That's why the Court of Owls assassinated him. He changed sides. It's confirmed that Talia has a Lazarus Pit. It seems like she was working with Langstrom, experimenting on League members, injecting Dionysium into their veins, and transforming them into... Oh, man bats. Imagine if, instead of a boss battle with, say, Killer Croc, the Arkham games made giant crocodile men a regular enemy type. That'd be pretty disappointing, right? What about if in Spider-Man 2, Venom wasn't a character but just specialist thugs covered in black goop? God, that would be a letdown, right? Well, along comes Gotham Knights to introduce an 11th hour enemy type in Man Bat. Kirk Langstrom never mutates like he's supposed to, instead these are hairy, winged ninjas. Kind of takes a lot of the zest out of them, knowing there's clones swooping about in the city. Which, ring-a-ding, means that for the last time we've got to dick about in the open world, fighting Manbat clones while we wait for the story to progress. To add insult to injury, Manbat is a god damn sponge. I am a level 32 Robin with legendary loot, fighting a level 31 Manbat here. It's taking me 15 minutes. That's a surefire way to keep up the pace at our closing hour. After defeating three Manbats, Alfred calls us up on the comms to tell us that he's traced Tally's signal to Gotham Cemetery. There's a crypt here, and it's time for the endgame. Because of the heavy emphasis on Talia and Lazarus Pits and the League of Assassins, Red Hood is the only knight that feels like he has some relevance to the story that's trying to be told. What is this? Some nerd shit? I made a distinct effort to roleplay as each knight during activities that I thought would be most relevant to them. For example, Tim Drake was the only knight who kept meeting with the Watch because I thought of him as a friendly neighborhood hero. So, as the credits loomed on the horizon, I picked Red Hood. Everything about the game was screaming that I ought to. And, I'm gonna be honest, that made the crypt an even crappier dungeon than it already was. <laughs> Setting your final confrontation in a cave is brave. The climax of your epic bat tail being split up into dusty, unmemorable caverns makes this a sequence that starts to blur into one big gloop of a level. Despite using the term, I hesitate to call the game's story beats dungeons because they're all explicitly linear, funneling the player from arena fight to arena fight. But, to give credit where it's due, this is a level that's structured with a bit more variety than any of the others. There's chasms to grapple over, lengthy sliding sections, bomb traps, far too many squeeze through the gap bits, a man-bat mini-boss, but battling the League of Assassins is what dominates. Open world play and level play are distinctly separated because for some reason Red Hood can't use his mystical leap to get over the chasms. Instead, we've got to slowly shoot grapple points, hook up to them, and repeat. Some of the bomb traps don't trigger, and even if they do, we can outrun them by just sprinting, so that seems like a waste. Even though we're on the final mission, we are berated by loot crates that just give us duplicate blueprints. But at the end of it all is our grand reveal, the shocking twist that the game's been building to. Bruce. Bruce Wayne's alive, What? There is a Lazarus Pit after all deep under Gotham and guarded by the League of Assassins. After he died, Talia brought Bruce down here, using the juice to revive him, taking his place as her general. The properties of the Lazarus Pit have grown arms and legs in this iteration of Batman's universe. It's not just resurrecting water that slowly rots your mind, it's brain-altering goo that brainwashes you. In the animated movie, Bad Blood, which is a sequel to Batman vs. Robin, where they do the Court of Owls story with a twist, we get a Talia with a similar plan. She wants Bruce to be become her right hand and uses Mad Hatter's brainwashing technology to corrupt his mind and turn him against the Bat family. You're not just a mask, Dick says. You're a man. And Bruce, seeing no other option, puts a gun to his head, thinking it's the only way to escape Talia's control. Weeks of torture and mind control broke him down. But when all seems lost, his love for his family is what keeps him strong. The Knights manage to bring him back from the brink. It's a really powerful moment. Let's see what Gotham Knights does. So you had to try out dying for yourself. 
Could you trust my intel just once? Guys, did Red Hood die? Jason Todd has an incredibly complicated relationship with both Bruce and Batman. There's every chance that his last words to his father figure were presumably pretty shitty because of the long harbour of anger he's docked his ship into since his own death and resurrection. In the comics, he's been banned from Gotham, so is touring the globe, trying to find himself, studying with monks and priests, and throwing himself into mysticism to try and find an acre of peace. In the New 52 comics, the ones that document Red Hood during the Court of Owl saga, this is a man, canonically, whose most important memory isn't his vengeance on Gotham's criminals or the thrill of being out in patrol, but a quiet evening when he had the flu and his father took a night off from being Batman just to sit with him, sharing a bowl of popcorn and watching a movie. Where is any of that depth here? Where is the emotional goodbye? Calling our confrontation with Bruce a boss fight is generous. He's a big grunt, barely any different from the godmothers or freak brutes. He punches hard, has a big slam attack, and he repeats those ad nauseum in a predictable pattern. Defeating him, Talia in a flash of anger tries to kill us, but Bruce sacrifices himself, jumping in front of her blade. I've seen criticisms of this act, Bruce Wayne gets resurrected just to die again, but to be honest, that's not my problem. I've got a list coming, bear with me, there's another boss fight left. The Court of Owls arrive as we ready ourselves to take on Talia, just so the game can remind us that they were in the story too. They're like, we're gonna get you Talia and your little Gotham Knight too, and then patiently wait for our duel to be over. Thanks guys. As for Talia, <laughs> she's a pushover. There are two phases and she's speedy, so there is a sense of vibrancy in her moveset. Keeping her on screen is the toughest part. Unless, unless you're playing as Red Hood and deploy your little overpowered turret. <laughs> then the boss lasts at most 20 seconds. I'm including both phases in that. The legendary assassin everyone, maybe if the game didn't rely so heavily on loot, gear, grinding and levels, this would have been a cool fight. And then, with her defeated, injured and escaping in a cloud of smoke, Gotham Knights officially shits the bed completely. If the game managed to deliver a satisfying conclusion that stayed true to any of its characters or its message, I might have given it a pass. But the closing cutscene feels like the sort of joke even the Joker would wince at. All of you grew without me. Become your own heroes. The knights that Gotham really needed. <coughs> Bruce climbs into the Batwing and decides to crash it into the Lazarus Pit, destroying its regenerative capabilities and blowing the Court of Owls to hell. He's going to kill everyone, including himself. Yeah, remember when the knight said this? Batman didn't kill people. Turns out that was a lie. Let the killing spree commence! Boom! Before nuking the court, Bruce makes sure to monologue them with a final speech that is so hammy and patronizing that it makes me glad Batman dies all over again. It was never the criminals who scared me. It was you, the rich who want more. This is a speech that lasts two minutes and three seconds. And you want to know the worst part? I agree with everything Bruce is saying. I'm a big old member of the Wokarati or whatever the hell people say. Tax the 1%, etc, etc, but chief, buddy, dude, this is pandering. Did you not cringe reading this script? Did the writer not cringe into themselves writing this script? Aside from the fact that Batman isn't one for grand speeches, what's the point of Bruce saying this in this moment? What's his character motivation for wagging his finger at the Court of Owls? Why in this moment does he decide that his last words on on this earth are going to be Politicians who pander to your reckless demands. Is it to purposefully separate him from the Court of Owls? Hey look, these guys are baddie rich, but Bruce Wayne is goody rich. I have talked at length in the Arkham videos how the Batman is a rich guy that beats up mentally ill people take is as shallow as a plastic plate, but Gotham Knights veers wildly too far the other way. And that is concussively stupid, but it's not the worst part. You all outgrew me, Bruce says. The music makes us feel like a really poignant farewell for the Dark Knight, but the literal action he is taking undermines that message. The knights don't save the day, Batman does. The final thing that happens in this game is Batman stopping the bad guys and destroying the Lazarus Pit while his sidekick runs away. This isn't the story of the Bat family taking over his legacy and becoming their own heroes, it's the story of four morons bumbling about a clock tower until Alfred tells them where the final fight is just to show up, let Talia al Ghul escape, and let Daddy Bruce save the day. You might want to run. Bruce's reconnection with Red Hood is so rushed just so we could make room for a speech about eating the rich before he steals the limelight entirely and undermines the 
central thematic focus of the game. You had one job, Gotham Knights. Depending on which knight you chose to finish the game with, they'll take to Gotham's billboards and address the city directly. It is only this knight. The others don't feature, like they didn't contribute whatsoever to this grandiose moment, and I don't know why this is something they choose to do. At no point in the game have we gotten a sense from this lifeless dirge of a city that the people walking its streets would welcome billboards being hacked by a masked man. They don't know what's happened over the past... 57 nights! Why did I play this game for so long? Just listen to how Red Hood opens his statement. The Court of Owls has terrorized this city for centuries. What? The Court of what? Who are you? The best part of the game, unironically, is the credits. And that's not because the game's over and I don't need to play it anymore, ha ha ha. It's because we get to see key moments from the story with the night we played as in the costumes we chose for them. That is bloody inspired. But the fact that it's one of a handful of positives I have to say about a $70 game that is a return to the Batman universe that I love so dearly, with characters I've spent far too long reading about, that breaks my heart. <sighs> okay, why does this video matter? Why was it important that I got it off my chest? The fanboyisms aside, my disappointment aside, I think the lackluster reception Gotham Knights had at release is important. And I think remaining steadfast as time revises its quality is also important. I've seen takes online that the game wasn't actually that bad and hey, if you grind it out, baby, there's a lot of fun to be had in the combat system, but I am afraid of those takes. Because if the games industry sees that, if they start to think, oh hey, maybe people are starting to want this again, we're going to be stuck with a ninth generation of video games that keep pumping out loot boxes infested with epic, legendary, and rare gear, action RPGs without any RPG-ing, and games that are designed from the ground up not to be enjoyed or to be inspiring, but to drag out player retention. I feel a responsibility to reject the design philosophy that created Gotham Knights, because terrible writing aside, I think we lost out in a potentially brilliant video game here because of it. What eventually emerged was the idea to make a multiplayer game in which users would team up to battle vampires and perhaps pay for occasional cosmetic upgrades. Developers under Smith and Bear said the two leads were outwardly excited, but as the project progressed, they failed to provide clear direction. Throughout the development, the fundamental tension between single player and multiplayer design remained unsolved. The same design philosophy that leaks through Gotham Knights permeated into Redfall, a game made by Arcane Austin that crashed and burned on release in 2023. It was a co-op game that was designed as a live service. Systems were designed around microtransactions, with gear scavenging, crafting and loot. An empty world that was made empty so that it could handle numerous players at once. The expectation being that you'd fill that dead air through finding fun with a friend. The core functions of that game were created to manipulate the player into spending more money. And then, before release, Redfall announced that there would be no microtransactions. Seeing the blowback to other live service games, they tried to rein in a lot of these systems so you could pick up the game, play it with some friends, and not spend a dime. But it was too late, and the game we got was... not good. During Redfall's development, there was a huge staff turnover, with talented developers leaving Arcane. This was mainly because they were frustrated by the poor management, true, but in the report that exposed a lot of Redfall's troubles, we hear that many left purely because they hated the direction Redfall was going in. We don't have confirmation that Gotham Knights development was like this, but it is hard to look at some of these design decisions and the interviews about player retention and not think that it had to be a little bit like this, right? And the idea of a bunch of talented developers, alongside writers who crafted my favourite dialogue in the Arkham games, being stuck in a similar situation is too grim to think about. This was WB Montreal's opportunity to step out of the shadow of the bat. It should have been better than this. And I'm never going to talk about it again. But also, when you're fighting talents in the late game to get two lives, you'll kick their ass, knock them down, and then they'll just slowly come back to life. Why is there no way to interrupt this? You just have to wait for it to happen, which means you literally double the grind. Hey, thanks for watching. This will be my last Batman video for a while. It's dominated the year so far and I'm Batman Duke my skull. So next time, expect something a little bit different that I've wanted to cover for a while. Massive thank you to Zolti Boy for designing the thumbnail and of course, Neil from Lore Dump for stepping in to help with some of the online stuff. He's asked me to say that... <clears throat> 
Lore dump is funnier than this, I promise. So there you go. Last, but certainly not least, are my patrons. Because of your support, I've been able to invest in a new setup that should be up and running in a month or so. We're moving house and I'm wanting to turn my office into a proper studio to make better stuff. That's only possible because of you, so order of thanks go to Vadim Orlov, Joe Pierce, Daniel Swan, Nikolaj Jorgensen, Damon, James Edney, Joe, AJ, Morbid Carlson, Michael Weingarter, Sushi Sasha, Atris Miller, Break Yourself, Jubilation Chambers, Abram Partida, Abby, Chancellor Delamere, Jeff Howe, Ronald McRonald, Crystal Mulreen, Patrick Salzer, Murderous Lord, Evan Schrader, Dominus Knox, Reed Ackerman, Oobly Doobly, Adam Harrison Fuller, Eric Evans, Andy Seco, Joe Humphreys, Caleb Gunter, Camilla Kuzovic, Quiet Ambassador, Paul Thomas, David Riata, Given, Jerry Humes, Curtis Newell, Asmodius, Joe Monty, Alec Meacham, Jacob Winnen, Wrecked 3501, Fox Reacts Gaming, Chris Durin, Ginger Kappa, David Neal, Halton, Jonathan Horner, Misfit Musica, Michael Smith, Mikolaj Kokot, Daniel Tarek, Clem, Prudvi Muva, Thomas Evans, Samantha P, Dapper Cyborg, Dan, Ernesto, Wang Goats Attack, Tenek, Mike Cripps, Bloody, Gabe, Webby, Patrick Forsell, Nur Revel, Eve, Tyler Cox, Procrastinator, E.P. Horry, Unlucky Dragon, Nikki Deedles, Gaming University, Yaya Schnitzel, Eddie Black, Abby the Bard, Elena Buck, Combat Wombat, Top Hat Tiger, Chase, Joe Jimenez, Wayward Flock, Larm Blarma, Fluffy the Demon Destroyer of Worlds, Thomas Pruitt, Spalter, Donations, Christopher McBride, The Slayer of Games, Daniel Boyles, Shishki, Wandering Alpha, Vivi, Mija, Ronnie Law, Reach Miedema, Captain Bon Clay, Alec Maxwell, Normal McPerson, your new roadmate, Michael Gallagher, Captain Cabinet, Logan Hamilton, David Brynjarsson, George Vincent, Eric Frey, Danger Zone, Chris McMullen, Chris McRae, Ryan Bryce, Ryan, Brenton, Matt Emmy, Matthew Halsey, Sean Toland, Jerome Hotchkiss, Prodigal Horse, Mr. Anthropic, Mike Chalabi, Trenchcoat Guy, The Heirs of History, Cody, Kyle P. Feely, Garrett Birchall, Chaches Vaz 76, Jack, Neil Mack, Sam's Forge, Joey Isbell, Aurelia, Kristen Fenchel, Neon Leah, Patrick Baird, LGX, Big Boar Wolf, Nicholas Chemin, Trevor Vernon, Mark Anderson, Joe Wilcox, Pleo, Blank Name, Leon, X Wrights, Shemax, Jonathan Riggs, Zachary Johnson, Daxter DK421, DNSCH, Monacari, Kieran Gresty, Lamar825, Ike N, The All Brand Man, Tempe, Unicorn, David J. Morin, Minito, Callum Armitage, Christopher Tierney, Torstein Sunness, Fipsy, Derek DeRosia, Luca, Tom Inns, Sammy Stuff, Jaguke, Alberto Calles, Captain Waffles, Type Raz, Dini, Zachary Powers, Andrew Muinos, Prospero, Alan Black, Callsign Noor, David Bedard, Jared Helfer, Mooker, John Foster Rag, Robert Capel, Matt McCulloch, Paul W, Chief Sweep, Ehor May, Jonathan Lum, Rees, Strupp, Angry Optimist, Mr. Fredo Renton, Long Cheddar, Toxter, Ashley Broning, 100 Sams, My Friend Neil, Nathaniel Waters, Dinkin Pearson, Kyle Pierce, Lonely Ronan, Kane Highwind, and Neve Care. It literally feels like yesterday that there were 30 of you. This is crazy. Thank you all so much, and take care. What is this? Some nerd shit? <laughs>